birth certificate. Now, I understand he's probably the first president in the United States who was ever asked to produce a birth certificate. So the original one was this computerized sheet of paper that most of us get. You have your birth certificate, don't you, Chris? Uh, I have a copy of it, yeah. Okay, so that's the kind of birth certificate. It's a computerized entry indicates that you were born on such and such a date in such and such a city, right? Yeah. Did you know, Gene, the one that they've released uh, was an unflattened <laughs> Photoshop job? Oh, really? With layers. Yeah. <laughs> Let me explain what's going on here. So the reporters are given a copy. We assume a scan of the original. And then what do they do? Well, if you want to have it on your website or in print, you then scan that document. And when you scan the document, you're going to do some image editing because you want it to look good on the screen or in print, so you enhance it. You enhance it in Photoshop. So, yeah, there might be layers, and layers in Photoshop means, of course, that you can have different portions of your image in different like different pieces of paper being placed one atop another and that allows you to edit each element of an image better now normally before you actually print it you do something called flattening we're almost sounding like the tech show here you know you flatten the image which is you bring all those disparate parts together okay so supposedly someone looks at the image on the website and they download it, and it's an unflattened Photoshop image. Each of the elements, each of the lines of the document have their own layer, and it's obviously been manipulated according to this YouTube video I just uh, got about halfway through before we started the show. Uh, it, it's astonishing. What a Homer Simpson moment, whoever was <laughs> responsible for allowing that to happen. Well, we assume then that was part of the pre-press or pre-production process for the website for the newspaper to prepare the image to present. Now, I understand it's perfectly normal to basically take images, whether they are documents or photos, and manipulate them. That's normal. But sometimes yeah, you're what, clumsy. You should well, we flatten the image. You flatten the image, by the way, also to make it smaller in size so it doesn't Correct. take so long to download. Somebody was just careless in the editing process. That's all. Well, and they left all sorts of fingerprints uh, all over the document, meaning at least, you know, I, I, again, I have not really done uh, a lot of research into this. Uh, it literally was what I was doing when you called. And I'm going to have to check this out because if it's true, it is the ultimate Homer Simpson moment <laughs> in government. I mean, what an oversight to not flatten a fabricated document if, if that's what it turns out to be. And, and boy, I'll tell you, we, I don't think we've heard the last of this story if, if this is true. Yes, but the question is here, was that done, that lack of flattening of the Photoshop image, was it done by the White House because they're not photo imaging experts, or was it done by the publication that actually scammed the image for pre-press or publication? We're going to have to do a little digging on that. Uh, <laughs> it's, I mean, there's a pretty interesting thread that's just developing now on forums.theparacast.com that uh, is addressing this issue. What's interesting about it is, of course, evidence, evidence and conspiracy theories, what sort of evidence meets the standard before you accept something is true. I mean, you can do this with anything, and especially if there is a translation process of scanning and rescanning, you know there's going to be loss in the original compared to the printed copy. You know they have to do some kind of manipulation, like a movie star, you see them, in a publicity photo, all the little zits on their face, all the wrinkles and creases, they're photoshopped out. It's not what they really look like. I mean, you take a fashion magazine. Tell me that every model with a perfect complexion actually has that in real life. Yeah, I've actually done that a few times myself. I was taught uh, some basic photo retouching techniques uh, from an ex Dugal engineer who, you know, was that was his job is uh, going – getting clients from fashion magazines in the fashion industry and then making the models look the best that they could look and, and you know on the printed page and some of the tricks that they use are pretty amazing i had a metaphysical yoga video that i was uh, designing the cover for and it was you know a, a, a good looking woman in her mid 60s and i took about 20 years off her and boy i'll tell you she really liked me <laughs> well of course you sometimes go watch these TV commercials for people who do some kind of plastic surgery service or perhaps 
they're offering some kind of medication to improve your complexion, get rid of wrinkles. You just know that what you're seeing there has been manipulated in Photoshop. <laughs> it's not real. Yeah. It's never that good. And also you have to look at now we have high definition TV where everybody's blemish or imperfection is front and center. So what do they do? They have soft lighting, soft focus on the cameras, things to make you look better, special makeup techniques to allow yeah, can... you to look your best when you're being exposed for everyone to see. Because nobody in real life looks the same way as in that, that picture-perfect photo. In the old days, of course, they actually used, right. like, inks and pen. Well, in, in gauze, they would put a thin layer of gauze over the, uh, over the lens. Now, that softened the image back in the 30s. Uh, some of those close-up shots of the starlet uh, is all kind of hazy and, and sort of dreamlike. That's because they would actually put uh, thin weave gauze over the, uh, the lens. My first wife, Geneva, and her mother used to do photo retouching. We're talking about taking real negatives and actually doing physical manipulation to retouch them the old-fashioned way way, way, way before we had Photoshop and anything like that. Well, today, the show is not going to be about something, whether it's live or Memorex. It's going to be what do the presidents of the United States know or not know about UFOs? And the answer, we hope, will come from Grant Cameron. This is going to be a good one. Our co-host is Chris O'Brien here on his network connection, which we hope lasts and don't forget to write us, news at thepowercast.com. Once again, that's news at thepowercast.com. I'm Gene Steinberg. I hope I last. You're in The Paracast. Are you ready to order the official Paracast t-shirt? You asked, we answered. We're now taking orders for the official Paracast t-shirt. It comes in white, 100% cotton. The front of it features the same logo that we have on our community forums. On the back it says, separating signal from noise. To order the official Paracast t-shirt, here's all you have to do. Visit our new online store at store.theparacast.com. One more time, that's store.theparacast.com. You can use a major credit card to place your order for the official Paracast t-shirt. Hey, neighbors, we have one more thing to talk about, and that's more merchandise at the official Paracast store. We have hats, we have jackets, we even have a flip video camcorder customized with the Paracast logo at the official Paracast store. It's all now available at the official Paracast store, store store.theparacast.com. Have you ever felt like the United States government knows way too much about your financial affairs? I continue to hear stories about property seizures, frozen bank accounts, confiscation of stocks and bonds. It makes me wonder if the U.S. citizen will ever again have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unfortunately, with the Drug and Money Laundering Act, the IRS Revenue Ruling 6045 of 1984, and the Trading with the Enemy Act and Franklin D. Roosevelt's Executive Order of 1933, some precious metal holdings are subject to government intervention. For this reason, Midas Resources has prepared a report explaining the boundaries of trading precious metals privately. Whether if you have any intention of trading with Midas Resources or not, I have instructed my representatives to give this report out free. Call for your free copy at 1-800-686-2237. When investing, always proceed with caution. Again, call 1-800-686-2237. Exercise your legal right to trade metals privately. 1-800-686-2237. This is an urgent message. Urgent if you care about feeding your family. S510 has passed through Congress and will make the sale of heirloom seeds difficult. Prices of non-GMO seeds are skyrocketing and may be hard to afford in the future, if you can even find them. As the economy continues to decline, this will make the heirloom seeds worth their weight in gold and one of the best barter tools available. When food supplies eventually run out, your solution is to grow your own food and barter tool. Now, for a short time, GetSeeds.net offers 100 packets of heirloom non-GMO vegetable seeds for only $59. Pay with two ounces of pure silver or just $59. The best price on the net for high-quality seeds. Our GetSeeds.net seeds are open pollinated vegetable seeds sealed in a Mylar bag for long-term storage. Bulk pricing available, so get seeds while you still can at GetSeeds.net or call toll-free 877-341-4769. That's 877-341-4769. This special announcement is brought to you by Renaissance Charge. 
Have you ever wondered if you could make your car run on 100% electric power for free? It is now possible. How about a simple device that is both a super efficient motor and a free energy generator at the same time? What if this could also be used to restore useless batteries and save you lots of money? Because our customers asked for it, we have organized a Renaissance Charge Conference Workshop on July 29th to July 31st at the beautiful Coeur d'Alene Resort in Idaho. Not only will you see these fascinating energizers, but you will be able to build some alongside genius inventor John Bedini. Participate in this truly historic event featuring our cutting-edge alternative energy, Tesla technology. Register early for the best seats and advanced workshop by visiting rcharge.com. That's r-charge.com for details. Or call 208-772-4514. That's 208-772-4514. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great Talk Radio starts here. We want to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Get in on all the action at forum.theparacast.com. We're going to explore what the presidents of the United States knew about UFOs, what they didn't know, and what they did with that knowledge. And we have Grant Cameron, and he has a site called PresidentialUFO.com. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in the Paracast. Welcome to the Paracast, Grant. Well, thanks for having me on. It's, uh, It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we're glad to have you on. And before we start any other discussions... In checking your website, you recently did a review of the book from John Alexander, UFOs, Myths, Conspiracies, and Realities. We had Dr. Alexander on the Paracast just a few weeks ago. So I'm really curious about your insights, and take your time. Tell us what you liked or maybe didn't like about his book, Grant. I heard the show with John. I've heard, uh, I try to listen to everything that he says. He's a, he's a key player. Uh, has been at it since 1947, so you got to respect. Uh, I've been at it for 35 years, he's, but he's been in it for over 60. Uh, I think he believes what he's uh, saying. I think he says some very important things in the book that I agree with. One of them being that in ufology, we sort of take ourselves a little bit too seriously. We think that everybody in the world uh, sees the issue as importantly as we do, and in reality, uh, nobody really cares. And when it comes to the government, the vast majority of the people in the government really aren't interested in what's going on. Now, he says really nobody, there's, there's individual people interested and no institutional interest, which I disagree with. But I agree with him in, in, in the fact that um, it really is not that big an issue outside of the UFO community as it is inside the UFO community. He makes some points that I also agree with in terms of the fact that the issue when it comes to disclosure and I wrote an article, one time it was called the 64 Reasons Why the Government Has Decided Not to Tell You What's uh, Going On. Uh, and one of the main reasons that John agrees with uh, that, that he brought up was the fact that this is a toxic to politicians, to science, to uh, almost anybody who wants any credibility in their life. And this is not an issue you want to touch. So I fully agree with John on those issues. Uh, my dis- main disagreement, and the reason I wrote the article, and it's for it's sort of an extensive article, but I wanted to get everything in there and then let people sort of pick and choose. The main thing I disagree with John's argument is that he sort of cherry picks his evidence, that he makes a case. We're a person who wasn't into ufology, didn't know anything about ufology, and you read his, uh, it's well written, it's well spaced, it's, it, it's very concise. You would come to the conclusion that absolutely nothing to this at all, that, that it's all said and done, and half the age is missing. Anything that sort of uh, gives uh, credibility to the fact that there is a cop, that the government is doing something, that material is missing from the book. So that was the main reason and the main thing I put on my article was to say, John's book, here's the other side of the story. If for people who are looking at this and who want to know what's going on, there's a bunch of material and a bunch of names and a bunch of stories that John has left out of his book for whatever reason. And if you see these stories and this evidence, you will see the, the field of ufology more balanced than the way John tells the story. 
the obvious question that arises here, Grant, is was John unaware of this evidence or felt it had no authority? Can you repeat that again? Was John unaware of this evidence you say he didn't include or maybe he didn't believe it? What's your take on that? I, I think he believes what he's saying. I think he, uh, my father filed for the Canadian government and my father was sort of skeptical, knew all the stories and sort of sort of stayed on the skeptical side with me and, until he died. He was always playing the skeptic. I think John just likes to play that side of the the thing. I think he believes what he's saying. Uh, I really don't know why he left out the stuff, especially the, the names of, of various people and some of the material that uh, that occurred inside the uh, advanced theoretical group that he that he ran. And this this is a I got the notes and John knows I have the notes uh, from these meetings. Some of the material that was left out of there, uh, I really don't know why he why he left it out. I don't think he he's trying a disinformation guy. I think that's just the role he plays. You know, he's sort of the tough green beret guy, wears the sunglasses, and and likes to play that role. I remember my father used to play that role too. Okay, and but you were so saying I, then when you play a role, <laughs> Grant, when you play a role, that implies you're not being serious about it, that you don't really believe the role you're playing. You're acting. So he's just doing this because he wants to be controversial? It kind of contradicts saying, I believe it. If you believe something and then you play a role, that implies you're play acting. That's not serious. So okay, explain I, I, the contradiction. In a, in a way, he's, 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 he's play acting. He knows some of the stories that, that he's left out. He, uh, it's almost like in ufology today, there's this sort of, um, sort of a conservative bend to ufology. Nobody here say the word ET. Nobody wants to say they know what's going on. Everybody wants the game like we really don't know what's going on. We've been working on this, but we think it's important for the government to us. We think that somebody should go and investigate it. Well, and you know my, what? I have my... to just disagree with you there. There are some people in the UFO field who do say it is ET, and we kind of know where they're at and why they're here. So there are different factions in the UFO field. It's not just this and nothing else. Okay, but the, the problem I have is when, when and I, I've done this for a number of years, I, I know a number of people who talk to in private and will talk, and the minute they get on in front of radio or TV, then suddenly it's like the, the story completely changes. They're not talking, for example, when I was at the UFO conference to John Rayo, who ran, ran the, the Congress, and I talked. I was talking to him about Alexander. I'd come to the Alexander speak, and I was very interested in this. And he said, oh, well, you know, John, he's the clock. When, when he's not on the clock, he's different. And that was, that's something I've always found with, with people that I know, ufologists, main researchers who are now saying, and I won't say who it was, a prominent researcher, when I put up my Hillary Clinton UFO website, told me, you're ruining ufology. You shouldn't use the word extraterrestrial. The government doesn't like it. You shouldn't use the word alien because CNN and then we'll over the story, and I'm saying this is absolute nonsense. You've got to go to a working theory. You've got to, you know, put out what you best think. If you, if you had to make a bet on a on a roulette wheel, if you've got to make a bet, what's it going to be? And you work from that. You may be wrong, but you work from that. And what John is doing is the same sort of thing. Is that he's afraid? He, no, he's like he's uh, upset about the fact that science won't take care of it. Government, everybody's laughing at us. And he's concerned about this reputation thing. So if we play it, downplay the ET part and the extraterrestrial part, maybe we'll get some congressman who will step up there and say, well, we should look at the uh, aviation safety or something like this. And we're going to get UFOs to go in to the government through the back door and the government's going to come out and make an evaluation, which is absolutely not going to happen because if we, after 60 years, cannot come to a conclusion what's going on, the government, who can't decide to do anything, is not going to touch this issue and come up with a decision as to what is going on. Okay, so Grant, so your gone. basic position here is that John Alexander was being politically correct. He didn't want to upset yeah. people. He just wanted to get his basic points across, hoping then he would be better able to get people to take it seriously. And that yeah. you're also suggesting other people in the UFO field do the same thing. They downplay yeah. certain more extreme aspects of the phenomenon in the hope that somehow this will gain better acceptance. And once they get the door open, they can explore that stuff that might be way out there, more extreme, exactly. more eccentric. Is that correct? Exactly. exactly. Okay. We'll get into more of that in a moment. We have Grant Cameron, and he has a website, which is all about presidential ufos called presidential ufo.com i'm gene steinberg the co-host is chris o'brien you're in the paracast hey 
Hey, neighbors, meetings are an essential part of any business. You know, making presentations to clients, collaborating with your colleagues. Well, make them as simple as possible to run and organize. Use GoToMeeting by Citrix, the easiest, most reliable online meeting service. With GoToMeeting, you can schedule an online meeting in seconds. Attendees can join with just a click from anywhere. Meeting materials are viewed on everyone's screen, making collaboration seamless. GoToMeeting is so easy to use for you and everyone joining your meeting. Plus, with GoToMeeting, hold as many meetings as you can for one flat rate. You have phone conferencing and voice over IP are included. You know, my listeners can try GoToMeeting free for 30 days, a month of unlimited online meetings free. Visit GoToMeeting.com, click on the Try It Free button, and enter the promo code PODCAST. That's GoToMeeting.com, promo code PODCAST. Reality check. There are many so-called health products coming out that are here today but will be gone tomorrow. They're fads, they're hype, and a lot of gimmick. Life Change Tea is no fad. We've been around for years, and we've been slowly growing, and our products have attracted loyal customers. Why? Because our products work. Cleansing your body, losing weight, more energy, and better overall health. And you might ask, says who? Our customers say. A company shows its colors with how many people reorder the product. So don't be afraid. We're the real deal. Log on to GetTheTea.com and read all the testimonies. In fact, log on and order at GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Or call us at 928 928- 308-0408. There's no call centers, just a friendly operator. 928-308-0408. Once again, 928-308-0408. The U.S. economy is at a tipping point. Forty cents of every dollar the government spends is borrowed. The president of the Federal Reserve in Dallas was recently quoted saying, this path will lead to insolvency, resulting in the collapse of our government and our economy. Our country can't function like this, and neither can your household. That's why you need to prepare, and priority one is your food supply. Fortunately, it's easy and affordable with the help of Ready Reserve Foods. Ready Reserve Foods has been a premier supplier of long-term storable foods for 37 years. Their unique process assures the highest quality long-term food storage available with a 25-year shelf life. A full-year supply of quality food for two people costs a fraction of what you pay at the grocery store. For a free, full-color catalog, call 800-453-2202. That's 800-453-2202. Or visit readyreservefoods.com. Ready Reserve Foods, making preparedness simple since 1972. For centuries, silver has been used as a powerful natural antibiotic. And as a listener to this station, you probably already know the benefits of using colloidal silver. With so many websites to choose from, finding a reputable patriotic company with great products at affordable prices can be a difficult task. Introducing UtopiaSilver.com. UtopiaSilver.com carries the best, most effective, and most affordable colloidal silver and colloidal gold products in the industry. UtopiaSilver.com also carries products to your lifestyle, including weight loss, immune system defense, cleanses, herbs, joint and bone care, and much more. First-time customers using promo code GCN50 will receive 50% off all colloidal products. Visit us today at Utopia Silver. That's U-T-O-P-I-A Silver. UtopiaSilver.com or call 888-213-4338. That's 888-213-4338. UtopiaSilver.com. Taking back America's health care one American at a time. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. Hi, this is Nick Pope. You're listening to the Paracast. We return. We have Grant Cameron. We're exploring so-called presidential UFO issues. And we started on the Paracast with Gene and Chris talking about the book by Dr. John Alexander, someone who says he doesn't believe there is a conspiracy, and the opinion from Grant Cameron that that's just something in order to be politically correct. He didn't want to step on the wrong toes. Chris, you want to pick up on this? Well, one of the things that you mentioned in your article, you, you, it is a rather an, an extensive, extensive review of, of his book, and one of the things that kind of springs out is the section called The Missing Names, you do point out, I think, very effectively in, in this review that uh, there are certain very important names 
that you would think you would have thought that Alexander would have mentioned in his book. However, the names of James Woolsey and John Peterson and a very important name in my opinion is Ronald Pandolfi um, are not mentioned in this particular book. And you would think with their very um, highly placed sort of insider knowledge about the subject, or you would assume they would have that, that knowledge, that these names would have at least been acknowledged and mentioned in the book. You want to talk about these uh, missing individuals, especially <laughs> Mr. Pandolfi. Uh, yeah, that sort of goes to sort of my history in ufology. I started out with, with a bunch of sightings, and I went from there to, uh, to and because I'd had the sightings, I, I knew there was a reality to it. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before in my life. So I really had never spent any time with sightings or that kind of stuff because I always knew what I saw, and I was basically trying to find out what's the answer. Someone must know what I saw, what, what this phenomena was. And so I went from, from the sightings when nobody really had put up a manuscript, nobody really cared. I went to the Canadian government to find out what the Canadian government did in the early years. And from there, we sort of ran into Dr. Eric, uh, Eric Walker, who was the former president at Penn State University. And we believed he knew what was going on. And we, for eight years, a bunch of researchers chased him around, trying to find out what he was telling us about how the cover-up started and MJ-12 and all this kind of stuff. And he was going to leave his files with the president. And it was at that point I went to see what the presidents knew about UFOs. And when I went to, I tell the story where I go first to the Truman Library, then I go to the Eisenhower Library, and basically they've got, you know, 20 million pages of files, and there's nothing on UFOs. And I thought, well, this is very strange. So I spent maybe 10 or 12 years working on the presidents and sort of became very depressed because in, in the vast majority of libraries, there's really no UFO documents. You really can't tell what's going on, almost like the president is involved. At that point, I sort of gave up on the presence and I started to get into this whole Avery thing. And I'd had interaction with these bird type people from the time that Bill Moore started this whole thing in the 1980s. And these are guys like Pandolfi, Kit Green, Hal Putoff, all these type of people. And I realized that these were people that Bill Moore had found and that these were people who had at some point in their life had some sort of classified interaction with the UFO phenomena or had classified background who were interested in the phenomena. And I saw some emails. I got, was leaked some emails a number of years ago, these people interacting, and they were at a completely different level than you and I. They were talking about stuff, and it was for real, and it was like, man, these guys maybe know what's going on. And I tried to push, and in the end it came down to these guys know a lot more than you and I know, but they aren't going to tell us. It's like a second MJ-12. They may figure it out for themselves, but they're not going to tell anybody what's going on. They're just interested for their own personal sake. So I started to follow these people, and, and, and I knew that some of them, for example, Kit Green, who was the former, ran the weird desk at the CIA, and Ronald Pandolfi, who took over the weird desk, ran the CIA uh, UFO stuff. Excuse me, the weird had, desk then is the place where they look into crazy things. Weird things, yeah, unusual but, things. I think they call it phenomenology. I think that's the term they use for it. UFOs, uh, remote viewing, all the, all the, the weird type things that, that the CIA might be working on, mind control, all that, all the weird sure. stuff. So uh, the first one was, was Art Lundahl who had run it in the, in the 60s, 70s. He was very interested in UFOs, was involved with NICAP, and then it became uh, Kit Green, and then Ronald Pandolfi took it over. Now I don't know who's running it, now with Pandolfi's still doing it. But a lot of these people have interacted with the UFO community. Uh, Lundahl is very famous, had a whole collection of, of correspondence with James McDonald, who was the prime UFO researcher in the 1960s from the University of Arizona. I saw his files, found this huge file of correspondence with Art Lundahl. So these people have all sort of been involved, and Kit Green uh, was involved with Dr. Eric Walker. When we were working on the Dr. Eric Walker story, Bill Moore wanted to see whether Walker knew anything. So what he did was he called Kit Green in to go and visit Dr. Eric Walker, who was then very elderly at, and as Professor Emeritus at Penn State at the time, and went to see if he could get Walker to confirm whether we were just making blown smoke or whether Walker really knew what he was talking about. And Pandolfi is, is the most famous. Pandolfi is just putting out stuff left, right, and center, uh, talking to different researchers. And in 1996, he was, he was written up as the top scientist in the CIA, which always amazed me that he's talking about aliens, he's talking about all this weird stuff. And how does this guy get onto the Internet and talk to people and put all this stuff out when he's the top scientist in the CIA? There must be something to this. And a couple of incidences actually 
came were, uh, for example, Bob Emmeniger, who was a prominent person who did the, the famous documentary in the 1970s, UFOs, Past, Present, and Future. I'm at his house, and I'm, I'm going to the Clinton Library. I'm looking at the Clinton files. He lives in Arkansas. I go, and I always stop and see him for a couple of days. And I'm talking to him, and then he says, uh, and he's been involved in UFOs since the 1970s. And he only was involved in the one case, the Holman Air Force Base film and the documentary and stuff. You know, we're and going all over the place here, and I wanted to just focus on one thing that you mentioned. Bill okay. Moore. Now, I first heard of Bill Moore when he co-authored a book on Roswell with the late Charles Burlitz, someone who was a friend yeah. of mine long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. Now, yeah. we also know that Bill Moore is the guy who said that he was involved in UFO disinformation. So why believe anything Bill Moore does or says? Well, I knew Bill Moore fairly well. I dealt with Bill Moore, and Bill Moore got on the inside. And Bill Moore had, as you know, Bill Moore had a very big ego. And Bill Moore figured he could play the game. I remember he, he was being contacted. And uh, I know the, the person, everybody assumed it was Richard Doty. And we said, right from the word go, it wasn't Richard Doty. It was a guy from the Defense Intelligence Agency. And we, we knew some of the people Bill was dealing with. And I never knew Bill t to lie. Bill was, was very arrogant. Bill was, was doing all sorts of stuff. And, in fact, Bill Moore has, has now fingered uh, Heineck as being part of the same group that was, that was feeding stuff to Benowitz. So okay, he, but now he, I want to get into some detail about the cast of characters here. Because you have okay. to realize that not everybody is into the Avery and Doty and all these figures. Maybe let's identify who these people are or were. We know who Bill Moore is. He was a UFO researcher. We know that he lost credibility when he admitted to being involved in disinformation. But maybe we can separate who is Rick Doty. We hear about Rick Doty. Who is Rick Doty? Who are all these strange figures who go in and out of the periphery of the UFO field? Okay, the, the Avery is a group that Bill put together, and the reason they, they, they gave him bird names was that he and Jamie Chandray, and Jamie Chandray had the intelligence background, that's why Jamie Chandray got the, the UFO documents in his mailbox. Okay, and, he's uh, the one um, who got the MJ-12 documents on film in his mailbox in the 1980s. Yeah, yeah. And so he was working with, with Bill, and they had to have a way to talk. Uh, they talked in, in code, so they used these bird names to people that they had made contact. And so there was Richard Doty, who was one, one of them, who was contacting Bill, and he was one of the Avery, who was sort of a counterintelligence, who was providing a lot of disinformation. There was Robert Collins, who Robert was the Collins. Condor. Robert Collins was on the Paracast once, long, long ago. Okay. Maybe you heard the episode. Okay. And he's not so much into the disinformation. He's more uh, can get a little bit, you know, with his weird with his ideas and stuff. Wrote a book with with Richard Doty. Uh, is very seriously trying to figure out what's going on. Had a, a U.S. Air Force background at Wright Patterson. Bill got in contact with him. Bill got in contact with Hal Putoff. Bill got in contact, and Hal Putoff runs the Advanced Institute in Austin. A uh, very prominent uh, guy who was head of the remote viewing program with uh, another guy back in the 70s. Uh, uh, works now on uh, Zero Point Energy. Very, very smart guy. Uh, Bill got in contact with uh, Pandolfi, with Kit Green, who he said was the guy who, who dealt with the president. Uh, so Bill dealt with all these different people. And with Bill Coleman, Bill had a lot of contacts with different people. And basically he was trying to find out what everybody knew. And Bill was the smart guy, and he was going to figure his way and, and figure out how the whole thing worked. And get I'll tell on you what, we'll, we'll figure out more about how the whole thing works which can be a tongue twister. We have Grand Cameron. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in the Paracast. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs. Convert from so many 
formats I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. Spring and a new growing season are here. Plant a healthy garden easy and fast with OrganicaSeed.com. Easy because OrganicaSeed.com offers one of the largest online selections of organic, heirloom, non-hybrid, and untreated seeds, as well as tobacco and cotton seeds at low prices. Go to OrganicaSeed.com, spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-C-A, seed.com. OrganicaSeed.com. Remember, Organica Seed is healthy seed. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Never buy home canning jar lids again. No kidding. When you buy Tadler reusable canning lids once, you'll never buy canning lids ever again. Safely store emergency preparedness foods for years. Traditional metal lids are single-use throwaways containing BPA. But Tadler reusable canning lids are guaranteed to last a lifetime when used as designed for home canning. Tadler lids are made with a USDA and FDA-approved food-grade plastic, safe for direct food contact, and contain no BPA. Tadler lids are dishwasher safe, usable with standard pressure or water bath canning, Eliminate food spoilage from acid corrosion, fit standard mason jars, are indefinitely reusable, and are proudly made in the USA. Place orders at reusablecanninglids.com or call 1-877-747-2793, 877-747-2793. Call 877-747-2793 or go to reusablecanninglids.com. That's reusablecanninglids.com for Tadler Reusable Canning Lids, the original since 1976. Will I have garlic breath after I take Ali C? We get that question all the time about the world's best garlic extract, Ali C. And the answer is, Ali C contains stabilized allicin, nature's antimicrobial agent, and the active ingredient in crushed garlic, but will not give you garlic breath. Scientifically proven in double-blind studies, using low doses of allicin greatly reduces the number, severity, and duration of common colds. Our powerful Ali C contains 300 milligrams of stabilized allicin. Just one tablet of Ali C is equivalent to 40 garlic cloves. It's effective against asthma. MRSA, bacterial, fungal, and viral infections, and helps lower high blood pressure and high cholesterol. Plus, it's a natural mosquito repellent. Boost resistance to infection with nature's best garlic extract, Ali C. For more information and to order Ali C, call 877-888-7126 or go to garlichealthproducts.com. That's 877-888-7126 or garlichealthproducts.com. Fight back with Ali C. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. This is Jim Mosley, editor of Saucer Smear, and I'm here to say a good word or two about the Paracast, which I believe is the gold standard of paranormal radio. Listen to it if you can. We return. The guest is Grant Cameron. PresidentialUFO.com is the site that has a lot of his research. We're exploring the Avery about the weird shenanigans of Rick Doty, Bill Moore, Robert Collins, and many others. I'm Gene Steinberg. Chris O'Brien's the co-host. You're still in the PowerCast for quite a while yet to explore all this. Chris, you want to probe further? Well, I think I think uh, Grant was on a roll there. Uh, it, it's really important, uh, as you pointed out, Gene, that um, you know the listeners have a have a good sense of who some of these uh, shadowy figures, as you put it, that have been flitting in and out of the field for years, who they are, and what their possible agendas are. And you know, it leads back to my initial question: is that there's some very important names in John Alexander's book uh, that aren't mentioned, and uh, Grant was in the middle of sort of giving us a blow-by-blow description of who some of these people are, like Ron Pandolfi, like Kit Green, 
uh, others like uh, Russell Targ and Hal Putoff, of course, who ran the SRI uh, remote viewing program in the 70s. You see the same kind of shadowy cast of characters uh, from the 70, you know, late 70s all the way through uh, the late 90s, that 20-year period. That's when a lot of this disinformation came out. That's when a lot of the memes that are now prevalent in culture, whether it's abductions, whether it's um, crash retrievals, these are, are I think, emblematic of disinformation. And um, I think Grant's done a good job in digging into the facts, identifying the players, and coming up with documentation that uh, that proves or disproves some very prevalent uh, theories and prevalent uh, beliefs that are out there in the UFO community. Why, why don't you continue? You were, uh, you well, were talking about... Uh, let, let me just add one. John Alexander was also one of the Avery that, that Bill was, was talking to. I would sort of disagree in, in this disinformation thing, that these guys, uh, their main role is disinformation. I think their main role is that they're interested in figuring out what's going on and that from time to time they put some of this stuff. I think, and, and from all the material I've seen, and I've followed the document thing from when MJ-12 document was first broken and stuff like that, I think the disinformation thing is overplayed. I think there is disinformation covering a story that is being leaked. For example, the MJ-12 documents come out, and the the whole thing, almost like the Obama birth certificate, it just explodes, and everybody's, you know, it's a hoax, and typewriters, and uh, all this sort of stuff. And basically, the, UO, the MJ-12 document was discounted. It was a hoax. Nothing to it. So Richard Doty goes off to be a, a police officer in New Mexico. Bill Moore quits in 1989 after the speech at Las Vegas. He leaves ufology, doesn't do anything in ufology. You would say, if it was disinformation, they've done the job, it's game over. So why, after 1989, did 4,000 more MJ-12 documents get released? Jack Vallée first is the one that brought this idea up, and it makes sense. We sort of overplay the fact. We think that we're so important that the U.S. government and whoever's in charge of this thing has to keep throwing us off the trail. The thing was dead in 1989 when Bill Moore left the MJ-12 document. Nobody believed anything. So why did they keep leaking documents into the UFO community? If disinformation is there, it, the game is over. It's dead. The, the, there's nothing more to do, and they keep leaking documents. So my contention is that it's not just to throw us, it's to throw us off, it's to burn Bill Moore, which is what they wanted to do, because Bill Moore had put out the Roswell book and you had to discredit him. The same as they went after Linda Howe because she put out The Strange Harvest, the, the Emmy Award winning documentary on cattle mutilations. They went after Linda Howe and what they were trying to do is, is discredit these top people who were starting to get credibility and at the same time leak the story of what's going on. There's no other explanation that I can see that explains why there's so many documents and why guys like Ronald Pendolfi are still putting material out. And if you take a look at it, it all links together. For example, I was telling this story. I'm at Bob Emenegger's place, and he says, and he hasn't been involved in 30 years in ufology, and he says to me, he says, I got a phone call from Ronald Pendolfi. And I said, you got a phone call from Ronald Pendolfi? Are you sure? And he said, well, that's what I think it was. And he doesn't care about UFOs. He couldn't. He couldn't care less. He watches TV, comedy shows, and I said, well, why would Ronald Pendolfi phone you? And he said, oh, he wanted me to do something with his RAM project or whatever like this. And I'm going like, this is bizarre. And then I'm talking to Dan Smith, because Dan Smith is the main guy that Ronald Pendolfi talks to to put this stuff into the UFO committee. I'm talking to him, this was only a couple weeks ago, and I'm talking to him about when he first contacted Ronald Pendolfi in 1991. He says to me, he says, I contacted Ronald Pendolfi. They, I was given a name from NASA and from England, and they told me to contact this guy. I contacted him. I phoned him. Then Ronald Pendolfi phones me back. The next phone call, Ronald Pendolfi says, I'm going to Los Alamos to talk to the aliens. And Dan Smith goes, this is weird. So he follows, phones Los Alamos to find out if, whether Ronald Pendolfi is going there to talk to aliens. And guess who they put on the phone? John Alexander. These names, they pop up and they just cross <laughs> in next to each other and they're all over the place all the time. So I said, to, like I said, to, when I was shocked when he said Alexander was on the phone. I said, well, what did Alexander say? And he said, oh, yeah, he knew Pandolfi was coming. And I said, well, what happened then? And he said, well, the, the trip was canceled. And Pandolfi phoned me and said, I don't mind if you talk about me, but don't put me and the CIA in the same sentence. So this is the kind of stuff, like, if it's disinformation, it's game over. We, we are, as, as, as 
Jacques Vallée says, we are an insignificant part of society. There's only a couple of us working on documents. It's really not going anywhere. We're not influencing anybody. Why would they spend so much time trying to disinform people when nobody's really reading it anyway? I put this article about John Alexander on the Internet. I have not got one comment back yet. People, it's on there. Nobody really reads it. Nobody really reads what's in it. When Ronald Pendolfi makes a statement, and I, and I had it out, and it came up on Coast to Coast when, when Smith was on there, Ronald Pendolfi stands up and says, in terms of the briefing of George Bush Jr., we tell the president what he needs to know and hope we don't have to put him down. And I put this up. Wait a minute, months. wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute, my friend. You put him okay, down for his Tell nap. him what he needs to know. Hope we don't have to put him down. What do you mean by putting him down? He exactly needs his nap. Exactly what I said. I put that out, and then when Dan Smith was on Coast to Coast, I sent the question to George Knapp, and George asked, asked the question that Dan Smith had put this on his on his blog site, that Penn Dolphy had told him this. And Dan said, Smith said, well, I don't remember him saying that. I can't believe I, it's on my website, yes, but I, I can't remember writing this. So this comes out, and it's like nobody even pays attention to this. It's a, to me, it was the most significant thing I'd ever heard, that the top scientist for the CIA says, we tell the president what he needs to know in terms of UFOs and hope we don't have to put him down. To me, that's significant, and nobody paid any attention. So they mean by putting him down, I mean shooting him, well, killing the, him? Well, the obvious implication is keep your mouth shut or you're gone. That's the implication. I mean, we asked Dan Smith, and Dan Smith just talks about knowing the Kennedys and his implication that maybe it comes from the Kennedys or something. And there really nobody makes that connection, but it, it, it seems very apparent. And well, it's how do we know there's right? a connection here, though? How do you know? What do you mean? How do we know that this means anything? It could be somebody just talking through their hat. How do we know that anything exactly. that might have happened to a president of the United States is related to the phrase, put them down? Exactly what I say, but what my point is that nobody paid any attention when Ronald Pendolfi says this, and it's on a website, and it comes up on Coast to Coast, and it's in my article, in John Alexander's article, which has been on my website for a month, and thousands of people have read, nobody has come back and questioned, what is Pendolfi? Nobody asked Pendolfi, nobody's questioned the whole thing. It's like it just flies away, and nobody does anything about it. That's my point. Nobody cares. Nobody believes it. Nobody cares. So then why well, that, are they that was Grant's point. point at the beginning. Why are they putting out 4,000 documents inside the UFO? That's page? why I wonder. Nobody okay. Cares. Well, the point is here, exactly. okay, you say 4,000 MJ-12 documents. That's more than Stanton Friedman claims, right? Well, well the, the the Ryan and Bob getting, Wood have. I mean, seriously, yeah. Doug, the Wood. Yeah. Okay, so the Woods have cataloged 4,000. They're, they're receiving this material, yeah, from Tim Cooper. So why is this happening? Well, that's the question you to raised. Me, to, me, to me, it's more than disinformation. You know, you're, you're discounting the whole idea of disinformation. Uh, you know, fairly, I think you're kind of given a blanket sort of uh, discounting of it. What about the Serpo thing, uh, the Serpo uh, controversy that Collins and Doty and, and Victor Martinez and Dan Smith oh, and others have been promoting? I mean, is that do – you, do you believe that science fiction uh, scenario or, do, or is it, dis, no, it disinformation? It's, it's, it's hidden. There, there is material hidden inside the disinformation. That's the way you put it out. If you take a look in, in my in my article, I quote Kit Green. Now, Kit Green is one of the Avery guys who really is not the type of guy who's making up stuff. I mean, Kit Green is pretty level-headed guy who is very interested in the phenomena and stuff like that. And Kit Green, when he's interviewed by these guys who do the Mirage, Mirage Man, the book, he talks about this. And he basically says, well, you know, don't discount the whole thing. And he goes through this whole scenario about if the government knew what was going on and they needed to tell the people for whatever reason, how would they go about doing it? And that's where this scenario comes, that you, you put out a bunch of disinformation. Uh, no, there are no legitimate documents. They're all phony documents, but you're actually telling something that's, that's going on. And the main example, that I, I can give you two examples. So give me the first one. I'll tell you what, let's one. hold the examples for a second. Okay. We've got to do the break. We have Grant Cameron. The site is presidentialufo.com. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien, and you're in The Paracast. Hi. 
Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you own an Apple iPhone and love to listen to your favorite programs on GCN, I've got good news for you. I'm proud to announce that GCN has a brand new iPhone app available for our dedicated listeners at GCNlive.com. Listen to your favorite hard-hitting GCN programs live or on demand right on your iPhone. And the best part? The GCN iPhone app can be yours absolutely free. Download the iPhone app today by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. We continue with Grand Cameron exploring what the government knows, possible government disinformation, all the players in this little group called the Avery and lots of other stuff. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're back in the Paracast. You had two points to raise your answer, Grant, please. Okay. The way the way it happened with me, and this is just my theory, but I was in it when it first started, the MJ-12 document, and I was with Moore and Friedman, and I was asking questions, because we put out a book called UFOs, MJ-12, and the government. So we looked at big time at this, at this document. When the document first was released in 1987, a friend of mine, a researcher, Bill Steinman, out of California, had the document. He phoned Dr. Eric Walker, and he said to Walker, and why we believed the Walker knew what was going on. He said to Walker, I've got this document called MJ-12 and, you know, this whole thing. And he said, uh, you were supposedly at a, a series of briefings at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And Walker said, you know, look, he says, I've known of them for 40 years. Leave it alone. There's nothing you can do. You're up against the windmills. So I don't care what he says. From the word go, days after this document was made public at the MUFON conference in Washington, D.C. by Moore, Friedman, and Chandra, Dr. Eric Walker was asked about it in 1987, and he says, I've known of them, MJ-12, for 40 years. Leave it alone. There's nothing you can do. You're up against the windmills. So from the word go, I immediately believed that MJ-12 existed. Later on, found the document was phony, but that MJ-12 existed. And there are other examples. Lear, John Lear, now you can say all sorts of stories about John Lear and about his personality, but John Lear never really lied as far as I know. John Lear told me, and he's told the story numerous times, that when the document first came out, his family was friends with uh, Twining and with Doolittle. And that his mother had a, that Doolittle had a thing for his mother, and he got his mother to phone General Doolittle. And she took her four months to get up the courage, and she phoned Doolittle and said, John's gotten into this UFO thing, and he wants to know, General, is there a, a thing called MJ-12? And he said, yes, there is an MJ-12. That's all I can tell you. That was the second one. We had a source that we put in the book, and nobody read this one either. So this is holding with disinformation. It doesn't really work because nobody reads anything. Anyway, we had a source when we put out the book in 1990. We had a source who had seen the M- a, a, either the MJ-12 document or something very similar to the MJ-12 document at a general's office in Okinawa. And we put this in the book. Nobody ever questions about it. Nobody ever asked us about this. So we had another confirmation of MJ-12. You have the uh, the Exler inman conversation where they talk about MJ-12. And we had, I had a source came up to me when I was lecturing at at Ozark from the National Archives in the vault. This guy works in the vault. He came with his girlfriend. His girlfriend was interested. He wasn't interested in UFOs, but when the document thing came, he sort of got interested in this MJ-12 thing. He told me that in the vault, he had talked to a guy who had claimed that he had seen the MJ-12 designator on a document when he was declassifying Joint Chiefs of Staff. So the point of the story is that... Okay, but let me stop at that story, Grant. Grant, I need to stop here. Okay, so somebody tells you something at a UFO event. How do you know he's telling you the truth? Because I went to to Washington, D.C. I I met the archives all the time. I met him at the archives. I talked to him. I put him in touch with Ryan Wood. Ryan Wood went to Washington, talked to this guy, and he said he's in the archives. He described to us the fact that that he believed that the document they had, the one that they got out of the Suitland, Maryland uh, archives, 
he thinks that they believe that it was legitimate because of the way they were protecting the document. He's inside the vault. He's declassifying documents. And he told all the people on the declassification, declassification team, if you see an MJ-12 document, let me know. And so he's basically inside there, and he's, he's interested, and he hasn't found anything yet, but he's looking for this MJ-12 thing, claims that somebody earlier had claimed they had seen something. So the point of the story is that from the word go, I believed MJ-12 existed, that whether the document was phony. So I, I, I admit the document is phony, but the MJ-12 co concept exists. Therefore, they're using the document to burn Bill Moore on one hand and to get out the concept that MJ-12 existed. Why, that's why in the 4,000 different documents, they're, they're putting stuff out. Let me give you a second example. I'm with, with Ryan Wood, and I'm in Laughlin, and I went to his house in, in Colorado, and we went through the documents. I was very impressed at some of the stuff he was showing me. There was one document he showed me. It was a citation for, for, for Cooper's father. It meant nothing to Ryan Wood. I looked at this, I said, do you know what this document is? It's a citation. It's the NPIC. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, his father got a citation for doing photographic work for the National Photographic Interpretation Center in Washington, D.C. And I said, do you know who ran it? And he said, well, who? I said, Arthur Lundahl. Arthur Lundahl ran the weird desk. So Tim Cooper's father, there's a citation. It's in these 4,000 documents. Who's going to notice? If I hadn't sat down at a restaurant in Laughlin and looked through these documents, nobody would have picked this up because I knew the whole story about Art Lundahl, the 59 psychic incident at the, at the National Photographic Interpretation Center. Art Lundahl's, uh, I studied Art Lundahl, and there was a connection there between Cooper and the UFO connection and why Cooper might have been given these documents. So these kind of things are, are coming out of these documents that are sort of telling a story. And the whole key to the thing is you can't ever release a legitimate document because if you release a legitimate document that can be tracked, then the story is over. The Washington Post will pick up on it, New York Times will pick up on it, and the whole thing falls apart. You have to keep the cover-up going. As Kit Green described, you have to get this stuff out, you leak little pieces, it's uh, covered in disinformation. The cover-up has to continue. The slower the material comes out, the better it is. And the other thing that happens is if, if I tell stories, you tell stories, who cares? There's nothing, as long as they don't control the hardware, the documents, they don't care. They want you to talk about it. They want people to be, to be discussing this kind of stuff. That's why I believe there's a gradual disclosure going on that they are releasing this material, keeping the cover up going, and that's why it explains the 4,000 documents. That's why this is going on. You know, one of the questions I always ask about this is, if there is indeed a UFO cover up that began in the late 1940s, how do you sustain something like that for 64 years with different administrations, different priorities, different CIA intelligence people? How is it done? Well, you have a, a very restricted number of people. The president really doesn't know. This is the story that Pandolfi said. We tell the president what he needs to know. Uh, in, in fact, Alexander, if you get Alexander on again, in one of the recent interviews, and it wasn't followed up by the host, Alexander claims he talked to Clinton. And Clinton, there's no doubt, and I, I've gotten thousands of pages from the Clinton Library. I filed 100, 100, over 100 Free Information Act requests. I've got all the material, and I think that Clinton definitely was very interested. Hillary was very interested. They were digging at this. They were going to researchers to get material. They couldn't get anything. So it, it's very closely restricted. There's a lot of stuff that goes on Area 51. What are they flying at Area 51? Nobody knows. I mean, it's like this Well, supposedly it's secret weapons. But the question about a president is, okay, this is the leader of the free world, the commander-in-chief. How do you keep the president in the dark about this stuff? Well, it, that's what the question that should be asked to Pandolfi. We tell the I'm asking you because you're raising the issue and you're quoting him. How do you do it? Well, I... I I, I, I just think the president, if you take a look at the president's schedule, the president basically is, is, is brought around, photo ops, do this, do that, do this. He basically has one million issues on his plate. And it's like the, the question of Obama now is birth certificate. He says this is, this is a waste of time. We have issues. We've got a war. We've got the economy. We've got, and, and John Alexander makes this point, too, that the UFO issue, if you come right down to it, is really not in the top one, two hundred, three hundred issues. Why? There are a lot if, of issues. Let's look at this, though. And the question I'm going to ask, and we'll pursue this as we get on here, is why shouldn't it be the most important issue of the day? Think about it. If ET is here, we have this advanced race. We 
can't compete with them on a military basis. They could present a potential threat. We don't know. They could be here for 60, 70, 1,000 years, whatever, have a long-range plan. We don't understand. This has got to be the most important story of the ages because if there is a disclosure, one that we have no control over, everything's going to change. The entire world will never be the same. You know, it's going to get out everywhere. So, yeah, it's important to know about natural disasters, the Japanese earthquake. It's not important to know about Obama's birth certificate because we never asked that question of any other president. But it's important to know about the state of the economy. It's important to know how we're going to deal with the deficit, how we're going to grow jobs. We understand all that is so important, energy policy, every one of these issues. But the big issue here is if E.T. is here, that's still a humongously important issue. Let me ask you about that. But first, we have Grant Cameron. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Have you been sitting on a few great domain name ideas but haven't locked them in for yourself? Good. Now you can buy them through the number one domain name registrar, Namecheap.com, as voted by the top tech blog Lifehacker. Just like the name says, you can buy domains cheap, as low as $2.99. And every new domain comes with WhoisGuard, our special privacy service, free for the first year. Now that you know, it's time to grab those domain names before someone else does. Namecheap.com. Go now. Namecheap.com. Fate Magazine provides true reports of the strange and unknown. Keep up with the latest on angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, life after death, and much, much more. To receive your free issue of Fate Magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. Dr. David Berry has provided excellent advice for all those interested in practical economics and sound money. It's certainly worth reading. That's what Congressman Ron Paul said about Cha-Ching Wisdom, 123 Practical Universal Truths About Money, the new book by Dr. David Berry. The cool part of this book, certainly it'll speak to you personally, your life, your lifestyle, your, your money, your investments, but it also can be generalized into the nation, what's going on as a nation. We do these same things as, personally that we do as a nation. Dr. Berry's book, Cha-Ching Wisdom, presents many facets of your relationship with the once almighty dollar and how current national and international politics are affect your daily life. Some of the other things are are about that. They're not just uh, economic, they're philosophical. There's psychology involved in this book. There's philosophy involved in this book. Read Cha-Ching Wisdom by Dr. David Barry, only $9.95, available at cha-chingwisdom.com. That's C-H-A-C-H-I-N-G wisdom.com. Cha-chingwisdom.com. On the average, Americans work between 45 to 50 years hoping to build up enough wealth to retire and live out their golden years. Unfortunately, with taxation, the rising cost of food, energy, housing, and medical, many retirees are forced to live below the poverty line. Is this a flaw free enterprise, or is our monetary unit we call the Federal Reserve Note forcing us into perpetual debt, ensuring inflation and higher taxes? These questions and more can be answered by reading G. Edward Griffin's book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. Congressman Ron Paul states it's what every American needs to know about central bank power. A gripping adventure into the secret world of international banking cartel. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. I will give a silver dollar from the early 1900s to anyone who purchases this book. Call 1-800-686-2237 and order a copy today. It's critical that the public be made aware of the system. Call and order your copy today at 1-800-686-2237. That's 1-800-686-2237. The food storage industry leader has done it again. Introducing FDG Clubs and Survival Bucks from the Freeze-Dry Guy. For over 39 years, the Freeze-Dry Guy has served various government agencies and the private sector with the finest in storable foods and emergency rations. If you've wanted to build emergency food supplies but couldn't afford it, now you can. Go to freezedryguy.com, click on products, and look for the Freeze-Dry Guy Clubs to pay as you go. Now you can build food storage without going into debt. Choose from a payment range of $95 to $450 per month. Our clubs work with everyone's budget. Plus, when you join Freeze Dry Guy clubs, you'll get additional rewards. For example, this month, get 10% back in survival bucks on all purchases in the Freeze Dry Guy product line, plus free shipping within the lower 48 states on any order amount. Hurry, go to freezedryguy.com or call 866 404 
That's freezedryguy.com or call 866-404-3663. The Freeze Dry Guy, the best you can buy. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. We want to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And if you want to catch up on past episodes, we have hundreds of shows for you to download direct from theparacast.com. That's theparacast.com. Or check us out on iTunes. Is the possible reality of UFOs the most important story, the most important issue confronting a president of the United States or the leader of any other power around the world? The most important issue they can confront. Grant Cameron is here. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. So go with me. Humor me here now. Wouldn't you think that the reality of UFOs has to be really high on their plate of issues? It would be high on their priorities, but if you read the article I wrote on the 64 reasons why they're not telling, if you were to give the... But you got to tell our listeners because they haven't okay, read Okay, okay, but, but if I'm going to give the briefing to the president, I'm going to come to the president, I'm going to say, Mr. President, these things are flying around, there's nothing we can do about it. We don't want to stand you in front of the press corps and have you going, uh, um, well, uh, well, we don't really know. There's a lot of people running around saying that they're being abducted, millions of people. They're all going to come forward and we're going to have to answer the question about the abductions, whether it's true or not. You're going to have to face this question. What are we, what are we going to tell the people? Uh, you know, you're constitutionally responsible for the protection of the American people. Are you going to stand up and say that you really can't stop them from flying around or abducting people, taking people, taking samples, doing all this kind of stuff? It's totally out of the control. Mr. President, we've got some oil we can drill here in Alaska. It's not the end of the world. In fact, Walker told us that one point. Walker was a guy that we believed there was no going on, and we were pushing him. We were saying, Mr. Walker, you're, Dr. Walker, you're an old man. Why don't you just give us this? It's, it's important and give us the issue. And he said, look, we haven't blown up the world yet. What's the big problem? And that's the whole issue. It's, it's, you know, we got 10% unemployment. It's not the end of the world. If you release this thing, I mean, some of the scenarios of the stock market going down and cra- crashing and not being able to bring it back up, there's a lot of scenarios that if you were to sit there and give the president the briefing and take, take a look and say, well, you know, the stock market may not crash, but if it does, there's nothing we can do to bring it back. Because, and, and this was told to me by a guy who worked for the Canadian government. He says, he says Grant, I'm going to tell you what. If you realize that UFOs are going to be disclosed tomorrow, sell everything you got because nothing is going to be worth anything. If you are a stock market, and I, I play stock market big time. If you're a stock market guy and suddenly it's going to be disclosed and suddenly Shell Oil at the opening is down from 100 down to 75. It would be down from 100 to about three cents, I think. Exactly. So so everybody's going to sell. And in, in, in the 9-11 when they close the stock market, you could bring the stock market back because you said, well, we're going to stop them from from getting on the planes, we're going to put marshals on the plane, anybody stands up, we're going to shoot them. And everybody says, well, maybe that, that will control things, but what do you say about the UFO thing? There's nothing. It's totally out of the government's control. There's nothing they can do about it. They can't stop it. They have no control. And if you are the president, if you are the person who's controlling the president of the United States, you do not want the president of the United States, the most powerful man in the world, to be standing up and looking like an idiot who can control nothing. The He's issue stopped. is toxic. I mean, Alexander used that word several times in his book, and I, I, I do agree. I mean, it is a toxic no-win situation. You're opening up Pandolfi's box uh, or Pandora's <laughs> box yeah. by, by even acknowledging that it is an issue. So, so what I'm getting here, Grant, is that you're suggesting that we're actually seeing disclosure, but it is a very orchestrated, uh, nuanced, uh, incremental uh, disclosure that's yeah. totally wrapped around events, alleged events like the Serp- Serpo scenario where we've already sent people to another planet and some of them didn't come back. And, you know, I'm not sure how much our listeners know about that particular. We had <laughs> a worms, show on but, this uh, early on, early in the yeah. life cycle yeah, of the Paracast. The other thing is here, I read the documents and they read to me like childish science fiction. For example, you have descriptions of life on this other planet by the exchange students or military officials or soldiers. And... They were describing bathroom movements and stuff like that. And you think, you know what? This is 
teenaged. Okay, but but the stuff is floating around. That's what they want. They want this material. And there's a guy in the in the United Kingdom, a friend of mine, Robbie Graham, who's doing actually doing a PhD thesis on this about this whole idea of dropping this stuff into movies and advertising and this sort of stuff. And this is this gradual, they want it to happen slow, because there's nothing, you cannot, I mean, Stan Friedman makes the argument, you can, and some, a lot of people make the argument, we're just not Stan. You can say UFOs exist, and we're not talking about the rest because it's classified. Absolutely ain't going to happen. The minute you say ET is real, there's something here happening, suddenly 5,000 news crews appear at the, at the White House. And the questions will start, and within five minutes, someone's going to ask them about abductions. Someone's going to ask them about cattle demolition. What about all these angry cattle guys in the West? And there's lawsuits, and there's, it's just a total nightmare. We're not going there. This, just leave it alone. And that's what I think they're doing. They're, just, they're gradually trying to get some of this stuff out so that if, it, if it, it collapses, you're not at square one. At least you're halfway down the road. And, in fact, Kit Green talks about this. He says, you put out all this crazy stuff about live aliens and they're eating our people and all this kind of stuff. And then when it breaks, you say, oh, it's really not all that bad. It's just E.T. coming here. And everybody goes, oh, okay. And, it's, and then when Kit Green is saying it, it's different if it's, if it's just some wacko on the street. But Kit Green is a, is a respected CIA guy who's a medical background, who's never really said anything really stupid. And when Kit Green says this kind of stuff, it backs up what, what seems to be explaining what's going on. Because this, any theory that I, that I think people bring up has to explain as much of the 100% of the evidence as possible. What John Alexander's theories do, they explain if you only take a look at 50%, yes, then that's the answer. But you can't just say MJ-12 was a phony document and Bill Moore was, a, was working disinformation and then is when the vast majority of the documents appear after he leaves, just sort of ignore them. It's happening for a reason. This is not Bill Moore, because Bill Moore is gone. It's not Tim Cooper. It's not Richard Doty. This is an organization putting this stuff out. And if there's an organization putting it out, they're putting it out for a reason. And my theory may be wrong, but I'm just trying to figure out why is someone going through all this effort? Why is Pandolfi allowed to go out and say stuff and not get fired? I can't believe it. I said, like, how can this guy say this kind of stuff and he doesn't get fired? It's just unbelievable. Maybe they consider him a harmless wacko. Well, no, it's sanctioned. Uh, it's sanctioned. These guys don't do anything by accident. Sure, Dan Smith said he had him investigated, and the investigation went for six months, and they came back and said, it's okay. So it is sanctioned. This is a part of something that he is doing for a reason. I'm trying to figure out why is he doing this, why is he allowed to do this kind of stuff, and what is exactly going on. And I think it's higher than the president, that the president, it's sort of, they've told him to leave it alone. He knows there's something going on, but better just to stay away. You don't really want to know, you know, plausible deniability, this kind of stuff. You know but what, the though, it also really implies the president they, is the not like as all-powerful as we want to think, that it's possible for the NSA or the existing military-industrial complex or the existing structure to go into the office of a President Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, all these presidents through the years and say, you know what, this is happening, but you can't do anything about it, and if you open up your mouth, you're going to say something that will cause further difficulties, that they have to be persuaded because they can also be loose cannons, and they'll say, you know what, I'm the leader of the free world, you can't tell me what to do or how to do it, I'm I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to tell the truth. Are but there any consequences? They Can they it? put those guys down if they try to do that? But have they ever done it? Obama said, I'm going to have openness, all these different things. What uh. secret has he released on anything? Nothing. Uh. You play the game. You're your president. Yeah. You want to go down in history as a guy. Suddenly, it's your CIA. Suddenly, it's your UFO cover-up. Suddenly, it's your war in Iraq. Suddenly, it's all yours, and you're going to do what everybody else does. You're going to play the game. You're not going to upset the, the apple cart because you want to go down in history as the guy. It's like, leave it for the next guy. The next guy can take care of this. We have Grant Cameron. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Ray Perkins, a reclusive veteran burned out from the Gulf War, lives tortured by relentless, perplexing nightmares. Nightmares of a horrific battle in deep space and of a mysterious woman suffering in agony for her devastated world. A woman not yet born, calling across centuries to him. Then, a coincidence leads him to his destiny, his chance to alter the universe. Attack, Attack of the Rockoids. The former fiction editor for Star Wars and Indiana Jones, Robert Simpson, writes, 
The soul of the novel Attack of the Rockoids lies in its heart and passion for building a convincing tale of a love that spans a galaxy. A thrilling story. Attack of the Rockoids is available now. Read a sample chapter and get a special discount off of the cover price at our website, rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Attack of the Rockoids, a novel in the grand science fiction tradition. GCN listeners, why have you been hearing so much about Dermatol, the all-natural, all-purpose first aid spray? Because it's the must-have first aid product you need in your preparedness kit. Dermatol is made in America by Americans who know there's a more affordable, natural way to treat cuts, burns, bites, rashes, shingles, boils, and many other skin problems. Dermatol is gentle enough for diaper rash, powerful enough for bed sores, and harmless to the eyes and mouth. It's great for the whole family, even your family pets. Dermatol is antimicrobial, antifungal, antiviral viral and not diminished by freezing extreme heat or years in storage dermatol is an absolute must for any first aid or preparedness kit dermatol's soothing rapid restoration of injured skin is so effective it's guaranteed order yours today call 800-217-6677 800-217-6677 that's 800-217-6677 efficient economical effective spray it all with dermatol The U.S. economy is at a tipping point. Forty cents of every dollar the government spends is borrowed. The president of the Federal Reserve in Dallas was recently quoted saying, this path will lead to insolvency, resulting in the collapse of our government and our economy. Our country can't function like this, and neither can your household. That's why you need to prepare, and priority one is your food supply. Fortunately, it's easy and affordable with the help of Ready Reserve Foods. Ready Reserve Foods has been a premier supplier of long-term storable foods for 37 years. Their unique process assures the highest quality long-term food storage available. With a 25-year shelf life, a full-year supply of quality food for two people costs a fraction of what you pay at the grocery store. For a free, full-color catalog, call 800-453-2202. That's 800-453-2202. Or visit readyreservefoods.com. Ready Reserve Foods, making preparedness simple since 1972. Hi, I'm Mark Craighead, founder of Crossbreed Holsters. I designed our top-selling holster, the Super Tuck Deluxe, to solve the problems of being poked, pinched, and gouged while carrying concealed. The Super Tuck Deluxe is the most comfortable, most concealable holster on the market today. We offer a two-week free trial and a lifetime warranty. Visit us at crossbreedholsters.com. Don't forget, CrossbreedHolsters.com. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. This is a Paracast. You never know what's going to happen next. Okay, so what do the presidents of the United States, President Carter especially because he supposedly saw a UFO, what do they know, when did they know it, and can the existing structure, whoever they might be, the intelligence structure, go in, tell the president of the United States, newly elected, taking office, oh, by the way, yeah, there might be something to UFOs, but look what's going to happen to you or to the country or to the world if you talk. Yeah. In all the years I've worked on the president, I think you can make an argument for both. And you can take Jimmy Carter, for example. Jimmy Carter came in, had said the UFO sighting, said he was going to get everything out in the open. But the, the part of the statement everybody leaves out is that he said, but if it has to do with national security or advanced weapons, I wouldn't talk about that. And that's the part that everybody always leaves out. So he gets into the White House. There's a lot of stories. In fact, Bill Moore, one of the documents he was floating around was this curious thing about the, the briefing in June of 1977 or whatever, basically stating that he was briefed. There's all these stories. Uh, there was a Secret Service agent under Jimmy Carter 
who claimed that uh, Jimmy Carter was told the story and that he was shown a color 15-minute film of a landing of an, at an Air Force base. And this is, of course, the Holloman Air Force Base story. There's two other presidents where we're sure they've been told this is part of the briefing. So he's, he's told that. There's a story that Jimmy Carter came out crying. The story that Billy Graham is in there to hold the president's hand. I mean, this stuff, it's so hard to substantiate. Jimmy Carter does push the issue. The vast majority of the f- documents that we have through free information today all came out under the Carter administration. He shook the tree. He had uh, Jody Powell going to the FBI. He had Frank Press going to uh, NASA. He had different people going around and shaking and to get the material that he wasn't able to. If you listen to what Shirley MacLaine says, Shirley MacLaine talked to him, and Shirley MacLaine makes this statement that Jimmy Carter told her when she'd wrote the book out on a limb that it was true. There were occupants. Sure, Why but do you believe only- Shirley MacLaine? She's supposedly just a wacko Absolutely. actress. Absolutely believe it. Why, why would she lie what Jimmy Carter told her? She's on Larry King Live. Why would she lie about it? In fact, there was Nicholas Cage the week before it was on Letterman's show who had said that Shirley was told that he had seen the bodies in the craft. And she said, well, no, he didn't tell me that, but he did tell me. And then she said he tried to open it up under the sunshine, but he couldn't and wouldn't, as he, as he told me. And she's talked numerous times about talking to Jimmy Carter about it, and that he had basically confirmed her. Yes, this was for real. But on the other hand, there are a number of stories where now if you hear Jimmy Carter interviewed, he'll basically now state he doesn't even believe their ETs come here from another planet. And if you see, there was, he was interviewed by a skeptical host on, uh, on a radio internet show, and on that one, he denied that he'd asked George Bush for the, for the, uh, the files. And that was the rumored story that when he became, uh, was getting the president-elect briefing, which is done by the former CIA director of the administration before, that he'd asked Bush for the CIA files. Now he's even denying that, that he asked for the, for the, for the UFO files. So and on any of them, you can play both sides of the fence that they know, they don't know. If you listen to Robert Collins, Robert Collins maintains, he says to me numerous times, he says, don't be stupid. He said, they're all told what's going on. They're given a basic briefing, and they're told, and they, they know to keep it to keep it secret. On the other hand, if you listen to Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton has talked about UFOs on a number of occasions and always says, I tried to find out about Roswell, and then he says, I'm probably not the first president that they kept in the dark or that bureaucrats have tried to wait out. And when you get a... Where did he say that? He said it in Hong Kong in September of 2005 in front of an, uh, in front of a, um, an investment seminar. It's on my, it's at the presidential UFO website. We recovered the actual videotape of him saying that. Let's go back to maybe the earlier history. We hear so many rumors that President Eisenhower, which some people believe was the last, one of the last great presidents out there because we had this great prosperity in the 50s. You know, everybody had a home if they wanted to get one. Everybody was well-fed, not so much poverty, whatever. I mean, the real issues are not so pristine, but whatever. Pleasantville, USA. What did Eisenhower know? We always have these stories, for example, that he went to this bunker or somewhere and saw a spaceship. He saw E.T. What's the real skinny on all that? There's really nothing concrete. Uh, we know the story, for example, the story at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, I went there. Bill Moore looked at this story, went to the Eisenhower Library, checked all the story. I went, checked all the same documents, spent days there checking all this sort of stuff. Uh, the story was that he was at uh, Palm Springs in February of 1954 and that he was scurried off to Edwards to see uh, Bill Moore tells the story of dead aliens. Uh, the original story in 1954 was that uh, the aliens were interacting with him, and then later on you get Cooper and some of these other people adding the story of the interaction and the the agreement to abduct people and all this nonsense. And almost all of it is sort of made up, added on, disinformation from Richard Doty or whoever adding this stuff on. There's all we know for a fact, and there's no doubt that he disappeared for a period of time at Palm Springs, California, and that the press secretary, Haggerty, had to come out and calm the press, sec- the press down because somebody was about to put it on the wire that he had died of a heart attack. We know this is all in the documents. But as to what happened, where did he go, really, that's where it all becomes foggy. Uh, after Truman, it's all very foggy as to what people knew. There's pe- important people under presidents who knew various materials, uh, 
like for example, Arthur Lundahl was, as I mentioned, the, the, the head of the weird desk under Kennedy, and Arthur Lundahl was the guy who went into President's office and gave him the the, the briefing on the the missiles in Cuba, and because he ran the National Photographic Interpretation Center where all the U2, the SR-71, and the uh, spy photographs were analyzed, so he was very interested. And he was under Kennedy, so there's more important people in administrations. But there really, if you come right down to it with presidents, there is really no hard evidence that really links a president into any of the events. There might be one example. For example, uh, there was a story that was always told when you, when you listen to the Roswell story about the fact that various people were sworn to secrecy by the president. And what I had done is I'd taken the names of these various uh, people at Roswell and had gone and checked the, the records at Truman Library, and none of them checked. So I went to Tom Carey and I said, none of this stuff checks. Who are these people? Uh, why, why is this not checking? And they said, well, it wasn't the president. It was a Secret Service agent on behalf of the president swearing people to secrecy at Roswell. So I said, okay, so what was the guy's name? So they gave me the guy's name, and the guy's name was Gerald McCann, spelled with two N's on the end. So I went, checked the Truman Library, and sure enough, there was a Secret Service agent under the president, Gerald McCann. And this is the story all these different people you'll hear that were sworn to secrecy at Roswell were sworn to secrecy by Gerald McCann. Now, to me, that was a very concrete sort of piece of evidence that indicated that, yes, the president, Truman, did know about Roswell. And when you take a look at – but if you look at the phone records, I pulled all the phone records – from the switchboard, the White House switchboard, from the president, all his phone calls during the Roswell period, his his, his uh, uh, appointment secretary is very important. Anybody wanted to see the president, get to the president, you had to go through the appointment secretary, all his phone calls. There's absolutely no phone calls in that time period that would indicate that the president knew what was going on at Roswell. There's sure, no but wouldn't you calls. massage those records if you wanted to keep them secret? How do you know those no, records these, are complete? These are, these are, well, I mean, sure, I mean, anything's possible, but these are handwritten records. I mean, these are like, you know, the little uh, cards, you know, like little cards where they, I mean, they went through a lot of work if they were able to, to sanitize that kind of stuff. And the other stuff they didn't sanitize, I mean, David Rudiak, Dr. David Rudiak, does all the interactions with Vannevar Bush and the uh, Research and Development Board, and there you can see all sorts of stuff going on, meetings taking place during the Roswell period, uh, high officials around Truman who are having these meetings, and you have, for example, the story that Billy Cox tells, where uh, this uh, games Ben Games guy is flying this General Craigie into Roswell, and he stays overnight and goes to whatever and says, "I have to go back and tell the president." So you have these kind of things, but in terms of the the records, I mean, how would they know? I mean, if people sort of figure that there's there's this cover up. I have found, and I've dealt with a lot of the archivists at a lot of the the libraries, that it's not the archives, for sure. I mean, these people are just as interested as you and I as finding what's going on. I'll these tell you what, we'll like get the, into more of what's you. going on in our next segment. Grand Cameron joins us. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Are you ready to order the official Paracast t-shirt? You asked, we answered. We're now taking orders for the official Paracast t-shirt. It comes in white, 100% cotton. The front of it features the same logo that we have on our community forums. On the back it says, separating signal from noise. To order the official Paracast t-shirt, here is all you have to do. Visit our new online store at store.theparacast.com. One more time, that's store.theparacast.com. You can use a major credit card to place your order for the official Paracast t-shirt. Hey, neighbors, we have one more thing to talk about, and that's more merchandise at the official Paracast store. We have hats, we have jackets, we even have a flip video camcorder customized with the Paracast logo at the official Paracast store. It's all now available at the official Paracast store, store.theparacast.com. 
Spring and a new growing season are here. Plant a healthy garden easy and fast with OrganicaSeed.com. Easy because OrganicaSeed.com offers one of the largest online selections of organic, heirloom, non-hybrid, and untreated seeds, as well as tobacco and cotton seeds at low prices. Go to OrganicaSeed.com, spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-C-A, seed.com. OrganicaSeed.com. Remember, Organica Seed is healthy seed. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. We all need to prepare ourselves. You might have the food, water, gold, and silver, but ask yourself, are you truly prepared? That's why you need to visit MainMilitary.com. MainMilitary.com carries everything you need. Gas masks, wool blankets, fire starter kits, high-capacity magazines, chemical suits, military surplus items, and much more. Do you own a firearm? MainMilitary.com has a large selection of pistols and rifles suited for your needs. Are your local stores sold out of ammunition? Call or visit them today for prices on hard-to-find ammo and bulk ammo orders. You don't need to worry about having a military surplus store in your area because MainMilitary.com is the only store you'll ever need, all from the comfort of your computer. Visit them online today at MainMilitary.com. That's Maine, like the state, Military.com. Or call them at 1-877-608-0179. That's 1-877-608-0179. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and re-cleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light System system today complete with two black Berkey elements for only $231 and the Berkey guy will ship your order free of charge. With the purchase of a Berkey light, the Berkey guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only $39.99. That's over 30% off the retail price. Call the Berkey guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653 or order online at goberkey.com. That's goberkey.com today. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. This is Jacques Vallée, and you're listening to the podcast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Our exploration of what the government knows and what they didn't know, trying to figure out what's happening. Now, I'm going to ask you this crazy question before we get back to pursue what we were talking about. The crazy question being, there's this overreaching, overarching conspiracy that starts with this crazy case back in the 1940s, the Maury Island incident in the state of Washington, one of the characters involved there in this alleged hoax, Fred Lee Chrisman, Later goes on radio as a broadcaster, a conspiracy theorist. Some say he was actually at Dealey Plaza in the days of the Kennedy assassination in Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. Anything to that at all? I've looked at it. It's it's one of those, it's almost like a disinformation thing. It just sort of swirls around and it sort of looks like, you know, he may have been there and there may have been this connection. But then you look at the Maury Island thing and it starts to fall apart and it's just, is cases that are that old and, and have that much. Uh, I looked at it. I, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't establish anything firm on it. No. Okay. It's a weird connection. I'll agree. I mean, it's a weird <laughs> connection. This guy suddenly reappears in, you know, in uh, the Kennedy administration. Right. But there are some. There are some of these weird connections where these people. I mean, there's one. I'll give you a weird one. I mean, James Webb appears. Every time there's a crash, 47, he was, uh, and he had different jobs in different White Houses. 47, he's there meeting with the president a couple days before, after Roswell. 
or after Oswald. The Kecksburg crash, he's there. He's the head of NASA at the time. He just he just appears every time there's a major incident. James Webb was involved, and and he really doesn't go anywhere. It's just this. He just happened to be there all the time, and it was kind of weird. So. A lot, a lot of ufology is like that. I mean, it's it's this sort of smoke and mirrors type thing where you get stuff and then the disinformation guys throw a bunch of stuff in there and they want people to talk about it and the general concept comes out, there are crashes, there there's a live alien, uh, this kind of stuff. But the actual nailing it down, they've got it to the point where nobody can nail it down. And that's what they want. The, the, the cover-up has to continue. That's the critical part of the whole thing. Because a lot of the weird things they do, for example, we have, uh, which gets back to this thing about the gradual disclosure, 1969, they closed down Blue Book. Okay, so they shut it down. Quarles is the uh, Air Force guy that shuts it down, secretary. 1973, they approached Robert Emenager and said, we want you to do all these documentaries. Uh, and uh, w- the last one we want you to do is on UFOs. And we want you to sort of cover it under all these other documentaries for the Defense Department. And uh, so he does this whole documentary. And then years later, he's talking to me. And I keep asking him, well, why did they, why did they contact you, Bob? Like, well, why did the government cooperate with you? Because it, it appears like everybody cooperated with him. And he said, well, I'll ask Coleman. So he phones up Bob, Robert, uh, Bob Coleman, who was the guy who pulled the Holloman Air Force Base film, who uh, agreed to the the the, the uh, script, uh, they went over the script and agreed with all this sort of stuff and put him in contact with people and stuff. And he said, uh, Bill, he says, you know, I, I got a question for you. You know, when we were doing this documentary by in, in 1970s, why did you uh, cooperate with us? And Coleman says to him, when the Secretary of the Air Force tells you to do something, you do it. Secretary of the Air Force was Quarles, the same guy that shut down Blue Book. So he shuts down Blue Book. Ends the UFO thing, like it's, it's dead. It's dead in the water. There's no more UFOs. It's like it's all nonsense, whatever. So why in 1973 do you come back and pour gas on, on the embers and start the fire again? Why would you go back, give Bob Emenegger all this stuff, and give him a legitimate hardcore story, the 1959 psychic incident that nobody would ever heard before, which involves Art Lendahl, the head of the CIA guy, being involved in this case, why would you dump all this stuff into the UFO community when the UFO community was dead? Nightcap, it was all self-destructing. The same as after Bill Moore in 89, everything self-destructed. It was like ufology was, uh, nobody wanted to touch it. So why do you come back and stir it up again, put more stuff into the UFO community? There has to be a reason, and that's why I think the idea that they're trying to get stuff out without interrupting the cover-up is, is a legitimate theory. It may be wrong, but that, that's what I think is going on. Well, what kind of long-range plan are we talking about here? Are we going to be talking about this if we're still alive 50 years from now? Well, they're still engaged in gradual disclosure, and, you know, eventually it's going to come out. Absolutely. I, I've always said uh, there's no way I will see the the end of this thing. To me, my, my thing is just to put down... Uh, the history of what happened as is, is best as I can for future generations. I think not a chance are we going to see this in the next little while. I mean, you have to look at how much do you think they have control over what's going on. I, and John Alexander, and that's where he makes the point. They, they, they really, nobody, there seems like there's nothing going on. They really don't have any control. If this is going on, and John says that, that they have instruments that pick these things up, they, they can't control any of it. So I mean, how, how many years is it going to be till it get control of it? Once it get control of it, because if you're the if you're talking to the president, you say, Mr. President, just give us ten more years. If you give us yeah, ten more years, yeah, but isn't there a contingency plan? Say there's a massed landing, oh, and sure, the massed landing occurs plan. around the world yeah. in all the major cities. We have V. We have Independence yeah. Day. We've got these huge motherships over major cities. Whatever the event is, don't yeah. we have some contingency plan? We hope we well, do, they right? Would, they would, Sure, they would. Sure, they would have a. That's where Kid Green talks about that thing. You put in all this stuff about live alien, about aliens eating people, and all sorts of totally wacko stuff. And then when it comes right down to it, you say, "Well, no, they're out. They're not eating. It's all. It's just ETs coming to visit us." And everybody goes, "Oh, okay, that's okay." And that's Kid Green saying that. So that would be your contingency plan, which is pr- probably still going to cause a lot of problems. But I think it's as long as you can hold this thing off. I, to me, that's if I was if I was in their position. I've said this numerous times. If I was in the position of advising the president on this situation, I would tell him to do exactly what they're doing right now. I would be part of the cover-up. I'm not on their side, so I'm playing the, the disclosure thing. But I can see 
And, that, and the reason I went through this whole scenario of trying to understand why the government was doing this, I couldn't figure out why Jimmy Carter had changed. Jimmy Carter goes in, he says, I'm going to release the UFO stuff, I'm interested in all this stuff. He walks in, and he, does, and he appears to do nothing. He, he did do some stuff, but he appears to do nothing. So what is it that they told Jimmy Carter that changed his mind to join the other team? And I said, there has to be something that they're telling the president that makes him play the game. Yeah, but it can't just be somebody in a room with a black briefcase, three men in dark suits. It has to be some compelling evidence that says, listen, Mr. President, this is what's going on. This is the video. This is the tape, depending on the era in which you lived. This is the evidence that is 100 percent genuine. This is why you can't do it. Exactly, as they do on everything. That's what I'm saying. Obama has released no secrets on anything. So you start the briefing, and you say, okay, this is a top secret briefing, you know, and, and he knows that this is, it's top secret. You, if you release it, you're going to end up in jail. We killed this leader. We uh, blew up this country. We did this. We did this. And there's a hundred things they tell him, but suddenly it's his. And he, and he has to take responsibility for it. So Obama has released nothing. Clinton was the only person that ever released any sort of secret when he talked about this contamination where they were using the plutonium and stuff like that. And Jimmy Carter got in trouble. And there's a cartoon that sometimes I show uh, that was in a newspaper. Jimmy Carter released the stealth technology secret. And he took a big hit for this. It was all sorts of backlash on the fact that he had released the fact that they had the stealth technology. So it's not something the president doesn't release secrets on anything because he's, he's sworn to secrecy. It's his thing. He, de- he doesn't step out. They, they never step out. So it's not that, I don't think it's that hard to get the president to reveal, to keep secret because there's a lot of secrets that the president is keeping. So it's by force of logic and evidence. It's not like, well, this president might be a loose cannon and he might release his information. Or do you say, hey, Mr. President, you know, if you release this information... You know, it's always possible you're not going to get up tomorrow morning. Well, I don't know, but I, I don't think they threaten the president. But I, and I think there, there's a story about the, the psychological profiles that certain presidents are told more than others. The Republicans are told more than uh, Democratic presidents. And this, the idea there was that, that uh, Bill Clinton, because of his background and running around with women and stuff, was sort of a loose cannon that you really, he could be blackmailed. You, you didn't want to give uh, Clinton as much as you gave, say, Bush, which is why when, when, when I got the chance to talk to Dick Cheney, and the rumor was always that Dick Cheney had been, been uh, read in, I asked him the briefing question. That's why I say if you ever come across a president or a vice president or a four-star general or something like that, what you do is you don't ask them are you interested or whatever, you ask them the briefing question. And the question I asked Dick Cheney was, Under what Mr. circumstances Cheney, did you meet Dick Cheney? He was on a radio talk show just in April of 2001, just after they came into the White House. He was on the Diana Reem show, which is a PBS or a public radio station show in Washington, and she often has uh, officials from, from the government on her show. He was on there. I had learned how to get on, on, get on the first call and how to, how to phone in, and so I phoned in uh, to the show. I was the first caller up. I asked the UFO question, and the next five questions were on Halliburton, and he was absolutely furious when it was all over. And he said, I'll ask you, know, you what the answer was in a moment, okay? And maybe we could have someone do a search online to see if they can find the audio for that show, unless it, you have it. There, we'll it, ask it, about that, it, too. Grant Cameron joins us. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in. The Paracast. <laughs> Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you'd like to listen to GCN programs on the go, I have great news. GCN has created a droid and iPhone application, and it's free. Just as easy as going to GCNlive.com, click on the banner and download. Before you know it, you'll be listening to your favorite hard-hitting GCN shows, live or on demand, right on your droid or iPhone, 24-7 and on the go. So download the droid and iPhone app free by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Thanks again for listening to GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. We the people grow cotton. We fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit, then carting to a private bank, having it led back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Ted Anderson, I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. 
Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Wow, we're talking about what not just the president, but perhaps the vice president knew, and when they knew it, especially Dick Cheney. You know, we think of him as being the Darth Vader of the vice presidency. Whatever your political persuasion, don't attack me. That's what some people think. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in the Paracast. All right, Grant Cameron, the question is asked on this radio show. Dick Cheney is there. You get on first. like to know how to do that. You get on first. Explain the question before we go into the answer. Maybe more details about how you pose this question. Okay, my, my idea was that I really don't care what Mr. Cheney thinks about UFOs. I really don't care if he's seen a UFO. All I want to know is, was he told the truth? And the truth to me, whether you're a general, a vice president, president, whatever, is somebody walks in your office and gives you the briefing, the real truth, the, all the intelligence. They gather all the intelligence together, and they walk in, and they brief you. They give you the truth, not the disinformation, not all the crap. They give you the real truth. So that was the question. And the rumor was that he had he had been read in, and because he was uh, chief of staff under the Ford administration, he was secretary of defense under the Bush senior administration, and now he's the vice president. So he's had a number of high-ranking jobs. So the question I asked, and I said, Mr. Cheney, it's been rumored that you've been read into the UFO program. My question for you is: Have you ever, been, in all your jobs in government, have you ever been briefed on the subject of UFOs? If so, when was it? And what were you told? They cut me off. I didn't hear it until I, the, the audio. It's April 11th, 2001. I heard the, uh, went to the archives and listened to the audio. And the answer he gave is, if I had been briefed on that subject, it would probably be classified and I wouldn't be talking about it. And then Diana Reen steps in and she's, I guess, taken aback. And she says, well, Mr. Vice President, have you had any meetings on UFOs since you got into the White House? And by then he sort of caught his footing because he didn't expect the question, I'm pretty sure. He caught his footing and he said, no, I've had no UFO meetings since I got into the White House. So that was the, the whole thing. And it was used effectively later on when we came across the 2004 campaign. I'd asked the question. And so when the 2004 campaign was on, I we knew Admiral, no, uh, General... Uh, Wesley Clark had, was campaigning. He was on the top of the Democratic ticket at one time. He was leading. For and about two minutes. In, okay, in, in, he was in New Hampshire, and he starts talking about the fact that he believes we can go past the speed of light. He's a four-star general. So David Rudiak finally asked him the question. Nobody would ask the question. Like, uh, mutual UFO people, state directors, nobody would ask a question. They said, well, we don't want to embarrass him. I said, well, if we don't want to embarrass the guy, I mean, why are we going to expect somebody else to ask him the question? We've got to ask him the question. David Rudak asked him, he said, Mr. General, have you ever been briefed on the subject of UFOs? And he said, oh, I know some. In fact, I'm going to Roswell tomorrow. This is right at the end of the campaign. And he said, so you were briefed. And he said, we've got problems with the mathematics. And so this is the type of thing that I say that people should use. We've got the, problems with the mathematics? We've what? got problems with the mathematics. That's All what he right. said. Sounds like he was trying to cover up the question and divert your attention. Well, it, was, it wasn't me. It was David Rudiak that was asking the questions. Sure, but I'm, so, I realize that, but I'm saying he was trying to kind of divert the attention. Let me ask you a question which occurs to me, because we don't know much about Grant Cameron. So I'm going to ask you the obvious question here. You're looking into possible disinformation. And I've asked this of other people, one of whom cut me off his mailing list after he got this question and will not sure. answer my email. And by the way, yeah. that's James Carey. I'm the former head of Mutual UFO Network. Okay, so yeah. here's the question. Are you a disinformation agent about UFOs? <laughs> well, there we go. That's it, folks. I'm a Canadian. Who would tell me anything? I'm a Canadian. I mean, I don't have any insight. That's what I said about John Alexander. I mean, I was able to get to Cheney. He's, he's saying, well, you know, he, he, you know, these people, he couldn't get any answers from anybody. Everybody denied it. And I said, I mean, come on, I'm a Canadian. I have no security clearances. I have no access. I was denied access to the United States at one point. I mean, no, here, I was going to ask you about that. No, it yeah. would be great if you could give us a, uh, you know, a blow by blow on that one too. But uh, continue. Yeah. So I'm I'm able to get this this kind of stuff. I I I'm actually disappointed at some points because everybody gets these documents, and I've only been leaked one document, and that was the document with the John Alexander's group. 
I, I'm kind of disappointed that nobody ever leaks me anything. It's sort of like if you're significant, if you've done something like Moore brings out the Roswell thing, everybody approaches you with documents and stuff. And I always figured, well, maybe I'm not getting anywhere because nobody's come to try to give me information. I've never been sort of approached and said, uh, you know, I've got these secret documents. They the don't government. like you. <laughs> well, yeah, or that I'm not doing anything significant. Nobody really cares what I say. But if you're if you're uh, uh, Linda Howe and you get you get this sort of uh, thing about cattle mutilations that suddenly goes viral back in the 80s on TV, and suddenly they come to her and say, "Oh, you're working on this HBO documentary. Let us help you. We're going to give you some footage from a landing at Holloman Air Force Base and absolutely shaft her around until she loses the documentary." I mean, I've never had this sort of indirect. Uh, contact by intelligence people offering to tell me stuff. I never had that experience. All right, you're Canadian. What is your background? Do you have a day job? I'm retired now. I just play the stock market. Uh, I was a facility manager at the University of Manitoba. Really nothing that had any uh, connection to UFOs. Basically, I w attended university and uh, the UFO sighting started in 75. I got involved basically quit university and figured this is what I got to do and spent years out in this field doing the sighting stuff, writing the manuscript and went from there and just my jobs and now it's all I do is UFOs. I go to most of the conferences now and I've got enough money that I can sort of uh, play the game for real because that's what I think it takes. It takes uh, a lot of time and it takes some serious effort trying to get to the bottom of the thing. And so I, I've tried to make enough money, and I've managed to make some money, and now I can play the game full-time. Okay, so tell you play us, the tell stock us. market, and you're lucky. Lucky, yeah, I guess you can call it that. <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's hear about your you know, misadventure uh, at, at one point there a number of years ago when you were trying to get into the United States. I, I believe uh, you were going to pre present at a conference, and, and you ran into some problems with uh, what we now refer to as the uh, TSA, or the Transportation Safety Administration. Why don't you talk about that? Homeland Security. I'm, I actually got it hanging up on my wall here. I got my uh, denial I, I hanging up on my wall. Uh, what had happened was I was giving a lecture, uh, the 64 reasons why the government is not going to tell you what's going on, and I was going to give it in Los Angeles, uh, and I took the flight that went through Vancouver, Canada, and then it would link there down to Los Angeles, and I, I, people make more of it than what it is. I think it was just a guy having a bad day. But I was in, in Vancouver, and Vancouver is where the uh, Air India jet left that was uh, blown up by the, the Sikh extremists. Uh, they lost like 400 people or whatever, so it's a very high-secure airport. And I went through there, and basically, I'm very honest, I told uh, the uh, U.S. immigration official, exactly what's going on. I'm lecturing here. Here's the pamphlet. This is my honorarium, $150. And she said, okay, fine, you know, and whatever, and gives me a piece of paper and go to this room. And then the guy said, uh, well, you can't, uh, you can't lecture in the States. That's, I mean, that's, you don't have a green card. And I said, well, I mean, I've been doing it for years. I mean, what's, you know, it's like a $150 annuity. I said, professors go down and, uh, and lecture in the United States all the time. And he said, you're not a professor. Don't even go there. And I said, well, but it's, it's no, I mean, I've never had trouble going across to, to lecture. And he said, well, we'll make sure that doesn't happen again. And then he asked all the questions, whatever, and then he disappeared for a couple of minutes, and he came back, and he had gave me the sheet, Homeland Security, has been refused entry to the United States. Uh, you're lecturing at an event where they're collecting money. You're receiving uh, uh, money in exchange for this. You don't have a work permit, and you're refused entry to the United States. So he handed this paper over, and I said, and he started talking to some guy. He's, he's laughing. He's talking to some guy, and I waited for him, and I said, well, what do I do now? And he said, I don't care what you do. Go back where you came from. And I went, holy cow. So I just sort of wandered out of this room in the middle of this. Vancouver was a huge airport. I, I had no idea even where I was in the airport. And I went out and some guy sitting at a desk. And I said, well, uh, you know, I've been refused entry to the United States. i got to get back to uh, back onto an Air Canada flight to get home. And I said, well, how do I get back? And he said, uh, I don't know. I guess you get on the elevator. And he opened the elevator for me. And I went down emptied out into this huge airport, and that was it. And then what had happened it was really kind of an odd thing. I, I, I was going through security trying to get on the Air Canada plane, and suddenly I get pulled for a second time, and the guy says, Mr. Cameron, your computer has come up positive for explosives. And I oh, boy, I want to get into more of this. Okay, let's leave this explosive comment where it is until we get to the next segment. <laughs> wow. Grant Cameron joining us 
I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in the Paracast. You expect professional service from your doctor, your accountant, and even the girl who takes your morning coffee order. Why not from your domain registrar, too? Namecheap.com provides stellar service with no sneaky upselling. We offer more features and security options for your website than there are ways to order a latte. And new domains come with WhoisGuard to protect your personal info. At Namecheap.com, you can get your domain for as low as $2.99. Now is a great time to get to know Namecheap.com. For 58 years, fate has provided true reports of the strange and unknown. Fate brings you the latest in all aspects of the paranormal, like angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, and much, much more. To receive your complimentary Fate magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. As many people know, ever since President Nixon took us off the gold standard, the U.S. dollar has been devaluating. What people don't know, however, is how this directly affects your personal finances. Is there a way to protect your portfolios from losing value? The answer to all of this is gold and silver. They both have maintained their purchasing power for 6,000 years. If you had $100,000 in cash and $100,000 in gold and silver back in 1913 and kept them until now, your cash would have the buying power of only $4,800, but your gold and silver would have the buying power of of $3 million. The answer to protecting your assets is simple. Call John Ballman today at 1 800 686 2237, extension 169. Get all your questions answered before your money is worth zero. Call 1 800 686 2237, extension 169. Take action today while we still accept paper dollars for gold. That's 1 800 686 2237, extension 169. If you own a septic system or if you're facing costly septic system replacement, this message is for you. When you want to stop paying for pump outs and avoid backups, when you've had enough of the foul odors and costly repairs, use BioSafe One Septic Solution. Now there's an easy to use 100% guaranteed answer to all your septic system problems. BioSafe One Septic Solution. BioSafe One is patented and made specifically for all septic systems and made by the same team of scientists who help clean up the Exxon Valdez oil spill. BioSafe One decontaminates and removes sludge, stops costly pump outs and repairs and removes septic system stench all with a 100 percent success rate see what gives biosafe one septic solution the advantage over any other septic product at biosafe one.com that's b-i-o-s-a-f-e-o-n-e.com biosafe one.com or call toll free 1-866-424-6663 that's 1-866-424-6663 biosafe one the guaranteed bio-friendly money-saving way to clean your septic system Dr. David Berry has provided excellent advice for all those interested in practical economics and sound money. It's certainly worth reading. That's what Congressman Ron Paul said about Cha-Ching Wisdom, 123 Practical Universal Truths About Money, the new book by Dr. David Berry. The cool part of this book, certainly it'll speak to you personally, your life, your lifestyle, your, your money, your investments, but it also can be generalized into the nation. What's going on as a nation? We do these same things as, personally that we do as a nation. Dr. Berry's book, Cha-Ching Wisdom, presents many facets of your relationship with the once almighty dollar and how current national and international politics affect your daily life. Some of the other things are, are about that. They're not just uh, economic, they're philosophical. There's psychology involved in this book. There's philosophy involved in this book. Read Cha-Ching Wisdom by Dr. David Barry, only $9.95, available at chachingwisdom.com. That's C-H-A-C-H-I-N-G wisdom.com. Chachingwisdom.com. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. We want to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com Get in on all the action at forum.theparacast.com We return. Grant Cameron is our guest. He's telling us of his encounter in Vancouver. 
at the airport about being on some kind of watch list, possibly because of potential explosives. Chris O'Brien's the co-host. I'm Gene Steinberg. We continue with the Paracast. Grant, please explain. Well, and again, this is where I think it came down to this Air India thing. They do a lot of uh, tests for explosives, and what they've done is that my computer, they had uh, pulled my computer and they'd done a test with a little swab or whatever, and it came up positive for explosives. So then it went to the same thing, and then I got 15 minutes to make the flight, and they start going through the questions, and there's people all gathered around me, all these agents and whoever they were, and the question, this one was last time these explosives, and I was like, I'm going, this is unbelievable. This is like, I was just like, the conspiracy thing in my head was going. Then what occurred to me what happened, I had a Dell computer, and I had the hard drive replaced about four days before, and I had shipped it off to Dell, to have the hard drive replaced, and I think what they had done is they cleaned the the thing with with solvents or, or whatever. And when I mentioned that, then they just sort of said, "Okay, you can go," and they gave me my computer, and off I went. And I was given a sort of an indirect message from somebody. I can't remember who it was that I would be on a watch list for two years, which is exactly what happened. For two years, every time I went into the United States. I was pulled, I, you know, the guy would say, you know, have you ever been to U.S. immigration? Says, yeah, well, that's good, you'll know where to park. And it was like every time. And I would get pulled door number one, door number two, the car would be going through. And it went on for two years, exactly what the guy said. And after two years, it, it stopped. So now I lecture quite a bit in the States. I go to the States, but I don't accept any honorariums. I just go, go on my own dime. And, well, you know uh, what they could I, do is right after the event, you get back home, and then they send you the check. Well, but that, that's evading the, the point. I mean, that's why I would say people say, well, just say you're going on vacation. But I say, you know, if, if I'm going to play the game and be dishonest at the border, why should you believe anything I tell you when I come to lecture? It, it has to be truthful. I, I have got enough money. I don't need money to, uh, to lecture. So I just, that's the way I work it. And I can feel confident at the border because I go across the border quite a bit. I live right at the border. The incidents that I happened when I had the sightings are right at the border. That We have the Miniman missile, three missile silos. That's where all the sightings took place. So we, we go back and forth across the border all the time. Uh, and it, it's always very unnerving when you're going to the border. They always treat you like you're like a criminal and, you know, you don't want to give anything away, so I just play the truth. I play the game. I don't, I don't want to have to worry about uh, getting caught at anything, so I basically tell the truth. And it saves like 150 buck on a ram. Who cares? If I can get across the border and not accept any money from anybody, I come across, and uh, yeah, so far it, it has not you know, worked against me. Well, I'd like to sum up a little bit uh, your thinking. Um, you know, you have kind of suggested, I think, to uh, to our listeners that uh, we're seeing a gradual incremental disclosure that's wrapped around, in some cases, even absurdities, uh, other cases, more more believable disinformation. What do you think the end game is here? Do you think that there's um, some sort of involvement by the military industrial complex or the private sector, let's say, and perhaps a lot of these secrets that Stephen Bassett and Alfred Weber and others want disclosed are actually in the hands of the private sector? Uh, do you have any sort of inkling where the separation uh, between government and the private sector lies? Um, okay, that's a big question. I think there, the private sector is involved. Uh, John Alexander's special access, uh, this group that they had, this top secret group, one of the uh, items that they were discussing was this Bobby Ray Inman giant engineering program headed up by Bobby Ray Inman. So they were looking into that rumor. I don't know where they got it because I just got the, the notes, just had to add it on the agenda. So I think the military industrial complex is involved. The back engineering is going on. And I bring up some of the examples in the John Alexander article where, where there is actually technology sort of being developed by people I'm trying to think here. Um, I, I, if you take a look at what Pandolfi says, Pandolfi, in 1996, he started talking about the fact that there's 200 people who have been given the briefing on the core story. And the core story is basically the, you know, there are aliens here, the government knows a little bit, we're working on it, we've got a crash saucer. Basic core story. Uh, he says 200. He said all flag officers in the Navy, n Navy intelligence. And that's one of the things I think is, is it's the Navy that's running the show. The Navy is, is uh, the key element. It's got nothing to do with the Air Force. 
uh, Wilbur Smith, who ran the Canadian government UFO program in the early days when I was around his people, I was asking them because he was, he had the top secret memo was getting this material from the United States, flying saucers exist, all this different material that he was getting. And he put in this top secret memo that he gave to the Canadian government. I was asking his people, well, who was he in contact with the States? Who were his, his things? And everybody told me the same thing. We're not actually sure, but we're pretty sure it was Navy people. So he talked about the, the Navy being involved. And Dolphy talks about the Navy. Bob Lazar, that whole story, suddenly he brings up the Navy. If you take a look at this uh, UFO cover-up live from Washington, D.C., this 1988 uh, thing, which involves the Falcon, which is an interesting story. Uh, the story there is that the Navy is running the show, and one of the stories that sort of backed up the fact that the Avery was more, or the stuff that Bill Moore was getting was more than disinformation, is that uh, the Falcon, we always claim the Falcon was this DIA guy. And I know at one time, Hal Putoff was getting material from me because he was trying to track this DIA connection with, with Bob Wood. They were trying to get this thing. And during this UFO cover-up live thing where they had the condor and the falcon backlighted and they were talking about the strawberry ice cream and the aliens and all this kind of weird stuff, this was supposed to have been a big disclosure thing. And I know Billy Cox uh, was very close with Billy Cox then, and Billy Cox was watching it. And he talked to Bill Coleman. Bill Coleman had said, because he was on the set when this, when this thing was shot in Washington, and Bill Coleman said he met the Falcon, and the Falcon was in the audience, and he was shocked. He could not believe that this guy was involved in the UFO phenomena. So I said to Billy Cox, I said, well, what get Coleman to tell you who it is. Coleman would never say who it was. But right from the word go, we knew it wasn't Richard Doty. We knew that there was a high-level official that had impressed Coleman, that Coleman was amazed that this guy was involved in the UFO phenomena. So this stuff was coming from Washington. It wasn't coming from Doty. He wouldn't have had time, and he wasn't that smart a guy. I dealt with him at one point. He wasn't that smart a guy to put all this, this material that was coming out in the 90s. So there, there was this, this sort of background that there were these people if you look deep enough there was people in the background who seemed to be running the show and putting this material out mm -hmm. well that uh, that just it's a uh, it's a hall of mirrors with a quicksand floor and um, there <laughs> as soon as you think you've opened up a can of worms and maybe uh, have some nice fat night, night crawlers in it uh, <laughs> you get thrown a loop <laughs> Let me give you another example of a, of a document that, that gets in this document thing. That there's no legitimate documents, but there are documents that do tell you stuff. It, your listeners may not be familiar, but this is a documentary that I see is a key story. One of the key stories in ufology is the Bob Emmenegger story with the with the documentary where he's called in by the by the military and talks to all the blue book officials and puts all this material out. And um, he is given a document in his book. He writes the book, UFOs, Past, Present, and Future. There is a document that refers to this uh, 1959 psychic incident with Francis Swan. Francis Swan was the last of the sort of the big contactees in the 1950s. She was being watched by the Canadian government, was, was investigating her. Navy intelligence was investigating her. FBI has documents on her. Uh, CIA is involved with her. And there is a file at, at Secret Service on her. Okay, anyway, let's get into the story in a moment here. We have Grant Cameron. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Is there a secret UFO agenda? Do strange creatures from the darkest corners of the mind roam the earth? Is there evidence for mind control, time travel, or devious government conspiracies? Find out the inside scoop on the latest conspiracies, paranormal activity, and Freudian phenomena when you subscribe to Tim Beckley's Conspiracy Journal. It's jam-packed with stories, special book and DVD promotions, and the best news, it's absolutely free, sent right to your mailbox. Plus, a bonus free email newsletter sent out every Friday. Simply send an email with your name and address to Mr. UFO at webtv.net. That's Mr. UFO at webtv.net. Find out what they don't want you to know. GC. 
ACN listeners, why have you been hearing so much about Dermatol, the all-natural, all-purpose first aid spray? Because it's the must-have first aid product you need in your preparedness kit. Dermatol is made in America by Americans who know there's a more affordable, natural way to treat cuts, burns, bites, rashes, shingles, boils, and many other skin problems. Dermatol is gentle enough for diaper rash, powerful enough for bed sores, and harmless to the eyes and mouth. It's great for the whole family, even your family pets. Dermatol is antimicrobial, antifungal, antiviral, and not diminished by freezing, extreme heat, or years in storage. Dermatol is an absolute must for any first aid or preparedness kit. Dermatol's soothing, rapid restoration of injured skin is so effective, it's guaranteed. Order yours today. Call 800-217-6677. 800-217-6677. That's 800-217-6677. Efficient, economical, effective. Spray it all with Dermatol. We all need to prepare ourselves. You might have the food, water, gold, and silver, but ask yourself, are you truly prepared? That's why you need to visit MainMilitary.com. MainMilitary.com carries everything you need. Gas masks, wool blankets, fire starter kits, high-capacity magazines, chemical suits, military surplus items, and much more. Do you own a firearm? MainMilitary.com has a large selection of pistols and rifles suited for your needs. Are your local stores sold out of ammunition? Call or visit them today for prices on hard-to-find ammo and bulk ammo orders. You don't need to worry about having a military surplus store in your area because MainMilitary.com is the only store you'll ever need, all from the comfort of your computer. Visit them online today at MainMilitary.com. That's Maine, like the state, Military.com. Or call them at one 877 Six zero eight zero one seven nine. That's one eight seven seven six zero eight zero one seven nine. The food storage industry leader has done it again. Introducing FDG Clubs and Survival Bucks from the Freeze Dry Guy. For over 39 years, the Freeze Dry Guy has served various government agencies and the private sector with the finest in storable foods and emergency rations. If you've wanted to build emergency food supplies but couldn't afford it, now you can. Go to freezedryguy.com, click on products, and look for the Freeze Dry Guy Clubs to pay as you go. Now you can build food storage without going into debt. Choose from a payment range of $95 to $450 per month. Our clubs work with everyone's budget. Plus, when you join Freeze Dry Guy Clubs, you'll get additional rewards. For example, this month, get 10% back in survival bucks on all purchases in the Freeze Dry Guy product line, plus free shipping within the lower 48 states on any order amount. Hurry, go to freezedryguy.com or call 866-404-3663. That's freezedryguy.com or call 866-404-3663. The Freeze Dry Guy, the best you can buy. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. This is Hilly Rose, and I hope that you do listen to the Paracast because you will learn a great deal about the paranormal. We're back with Grand Cameron on the Paracast with Gene and Chris. We've only got two segments left. And now you're talking about this contactee, as you say, okay. perhaps the last big contactee of the 1950s. What happened? Okay. So Bob has this, puts this, what's called a memorandum for the record in his book. He leaves all the names out of it. And basically it's the story of the fact that the Navy intelligence gets interested in this woman in 1954. They go to her. She teaches them how to do this channeling. The one Navy intelligence officer goes racing back to the CIA, to the National Photographic Interpretation Center, where they analyze all the, all the spy photographs and stuff like that. Art Lundahl runs the, the, the building. He's interested in UFOs. He said, okay, sit down, go into the trance. They go into the trance. They're talking to this alien by the name of Alpha. And Art Lundahl says, okay, we want you to prove, our, prove yourself. Alpha says, how? Uh, show yourself. And Alpha says, go to the window. And they go to the window, and this flying saucer flies by, Daylight, Washington, D.C., over top of the Capitol. Okay, so anyway, they have this memo, Art Lundahl, and Ammenegger talked to Lundahl during the filming in, 19, in the 70s. Art Lundahl says, yes, he wrote the memo. Okay, so Bob's got it in his book. So I'm going to Bob and saying, where's the memo? Where's this memo that you've got in your book? And he said, well, you know, I don't remember where I got it from and all this sort of stuff. So Eric Davis, who is the physicist at NIDS, is working on this thing with me. And suddenly I put the story up and all this sort of stuff. He says, okay you're going to get the, the memo. The memo comes to me from Jacques Vallée. Jacques Vallée says, okay, you've got the story up on your website. 
here's the memo. And the memo, it, but it's not the actual memo, the CIA memo typed, it's handwritten. The story is that Art Lundahl, the CIA guy, had written the memo, gave it to Friend at, at, at the Air Force, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, was sitting on his desk. J. Allen Hynek looked at the memo, realized the significance of the memo, and hand-copied the entire memo. It's 11 pages in J. Allen Hynek's hand, handwriting, and he gives it to Jacques Vallée. And after I put the story on the, the Internet, Jacques Vallée says, here's the document, you can put it on your website. I put it up on my website. It's got all the names, it's got everything. Here's this document, which Phil Class, I went to see Phil Class's files a couple of times in the last month. I went to see Phil Class, and this is, I'll, I'll quote what Phil Class says about this. Uh, Phil Class is, is looking at this case, so he's got a huge file on this thing, and Phil Class says, heavens, he's talking to uh, Jacobs, who was, uh, David Jacobs, who's working with Eminegger on the documentary. He says, heavens, this should rank as one of the most credible, one of the most impressive UFO incidents of all times, if the memorandum for the record is a legitimate account of events that transcribe, and that transpired. The thing is, we don't have the actual memo. We got a copy written by J. Allen Hynek. So you get the document, but it's not the real document. It's not something you can go to the New York Times, to the Washington Post, and say, here's the document, go with it. There's always like the, the this sort of sift, uh, you know, moving sand and <laughs> plausible and deniability. Words. Yeah, but even when you get legitimate documents, nothing happens which happened with the, I got a thousand pages from the Clinton Library in 2001. Two of the documents refer to Hillary Clinton's involvement in UFOs. And the one document clearly states that she was helping to edit a document on UFO disclosure to the president. She was helping Lawrence Rockefeller edit this. So when I filed all the Freedom of Information Act requests, because I knew how the, how the thing worked with the presidential library five years after the president leaves office, that's when the records uh, start to be released, first come, first serve. So I had 100 Freedom of Information Act requests in. So when the first 19 FOAs are released by the Clinton Library, 11 of them are UFO, all my, my Freedom of Information Act requests. So suddenly everybody is on this story. Why are the, uh, the uh, Clintons releasing all these UFO documents? Everybody's waiting for Hillary's uh, records because she's running for president. This is a waste of time. What are these UFO documents? So I'm starting to get, I get calls from Fox. Washington Post talked to me for an hour and a quarter. Associated Press, all the, everybody was wanting to know about why I had these UFO documents, what was in these UFO documents. I sent every one of these major people, these two documents on Hillary Clinton and said, Hillary's running for president. Here are two UFO documents that clearly shows that she had an interest and an involvement in UFOs, and nobody did a thing with those documents. And that was the top people. Washington Post, I was, sh I was shocked. There was two long interviews. It was an hour and a quarter between the two interviews, asking all these questions. Nothing. They did nothing with the documents. So even when you get legitimate documents, nobody does anything. And John Alexander's right. Nobody really cares, or it's a toxic issue to a news Yeah, it's toxic. You really don't want to do this. Well, to me, that would have been the biggest story ever. Hillary Clinton running for president is into UFOs, but no, we're not touching it for whatever reason. Well, yeah, and and you know, in the intervening years since her involvement with the um, original uh, Rockefeller Initiative and the Disclosure Project, Antonio Huneas, uh, by the way, has a very good article on Lawrence Rockefeller's involvement in the UFO issue. Uh, Peter Storick and uh, Don Blinner and Antonio and uh, even myself was helped by by Rockefeller. He had an, an incredible interest in the subject, but nobody has ever really put that down in one place. And uh, at the risk of sounding uh, like I'm promoting uh, <laughs> the Open Minds organization. They're, they do have a very excellent magazine. Also, Antonio's a good guy. I've known him for years. And Antonio's years. a great guy and a very good writer. And his, uh, his involvement with Rockefeller gives him an insider perspective. And he did a great job uh, three, I think, issues ago in the Open Minds magazine of putting all this information down. So I personally asked uh, Lawrence Rockefeller about uh, the extent of government knowledge uh, about UFOs, whether there was ever going to be uh, some sort of disclosure process. And he, was, he seemed le legitimately and truly as in the dark as everybody else. And because he was uh, highly placed and in, in influential, and most billionaires can uh, get people to listen to them generally, um, he was really uh, putting his money where his mouth was and really attempting in his very charming way to try to get to the bottom of this issue. Now, 
Grant, since 1975, you've obviously been uh, almost verging on obsession. You've had an incredible deep interest in this subject. How can you keep going for so many years? And, and you know, you're giving us example after example of hard work that's just not being – it's being tossed aside. Uh, like people – you know, I, I understand that the issue is toxic and everything, but what keeps you going? I mean, are you still looking for that smoking gun piece of documentation? Uh, I, I'm just very curious about your own motivations about this because, uh, I mean – you're an unsung hero here. You're you're uh, you're spending a lot of resources, a lot of time. Um, I, I mean, I, I've done the research. I, I know how much work it is. What keeps you going? Yeah, I, I think it's it's part the sort of to me. It's always like a game. That's why I say when it comes to a theory, to me it's always like you're making a bet on a stock or the roulette wheel is rolling and the the, the ball's rolling around and you got to make your bet. You 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 want to try to to get it. And, and figure it out because I, I saw what I saw and I really wasn't interested in, in trying to prove to myself or anybody that these things existed. I knew that there was a very weird phenomenon going on and, and I needed to get the answer. And some of the people that were with How did me, you know there was a weird phenomenon going on? I'm going to ask you the very obvious question. Was this because of your research? It no, sounds like I it's coming no, before no the fact. I had, I had interest. I had done some work at the university on near-death studies, which I really like John Alexander because he can't be all that bad a guy if he's into near-death studies. I was very interested in near-death studies, but I had, can't ever remember being interested in UFOs. It was just that there was this flap going on at the end of the Vietnam War here, just north of the missile silos. It was just, it was intense every day, and it was uh, something where it was a newspaper, and suddenly the local TV station got this thing jumping off the ground, and it was just, it was like pandemonium. Everybody here knew the story, and I said, well, to my friends, let's go and see whatever he's looking at. He's like, I didn't know what, what it was going to look like or whatever. And I remember we drove around for an hour into the town, out of the town, in you know, and it was like, well, you buy the lottery ticket, and you think, well, you know, uh, probably not going to win, and it's exactly what I figured. After an hour, I figured like this is a total waste of time. Everybody else sees it. Of course, it's not going to show up when we come, and it just it was instant. And I talked to people about there's belief, disbelief, and then there's knowing. Whether you believe, disbelief, who cares? It doesn't, really doesn't affect reality. Only the people who've seen it know. And I remember we were looking at this thing, and it was like as soon as this thing appeared in front of the car, it came bou- bouncing up and down right in front of the car, about a mile down the road, very, very low, pulsing, red, just the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. It wasn't like we'd been driving around for an hour saying, well, is that what they're looking at? We're looking at stars, planets. Is that what they're looking at? Is that what they're looking at? We're trying to figure out. As soon as this thing appeared, everybody in the car said the same thing. There it is. It was like instantaneous. This is what everybody's talking about. We didn't have to analyze, well, is this what the UFO looks like or whatever. It was so strange. It was so bizarre. And then I had numerous other experiences which were really bizarre. Got I'll tell you what, we'll get into the, the bizarre experiences of Grand Cameron and a few other things in our final segment. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in The Paracast. <laughs> Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs convert from so many files formats I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code Night Owl. Use the coupon code Night Owl to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. <laughs> Are you still a traditional smoker? Now experience a new lifestyle and try vaping with e-cigarettes by LeSig. Imagine no ashes, stains, nasty smell, or coughing and hacking. With LeSig e-cigarettes revolutionary microelectronic technology, rechargeable battery, and unique replaceable cartridge, you'll get all the benefits and satisfaction of smoking without the hazards. Choose your taste from a wide variety of our new American-made vaporeate e-liquids at LeSig.com. And LeSig smokes the competition by serving thousands of worldwide customers with real people customer service, fast, free, same-day shipping, and a 30 
30-day warranty and satisfaction guarantee. So are you ready for a new vaping lifestyle? Then call 870-518-4307. That's 870-518-4307. Or visit LeSig.com, spelled L-E-C-I-G.com. LeSig e-cigarettes for today's modern smoker. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years in serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light System system today complete with two black berkey elements for only 231 dollars and the berkey guy will ship your order free of charge with the purchase of a berkey light the berkey guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only 39.99 that's over 30 percent off the retail price call the berkey guy at 1-877-886-3653 that's 1-877-886-3653 or order online at goberkey.com that's goberkey.com today Concerned about radioactive fallout? The number one way by which your body protects itself from radiation or any other free radical is with glutathione. Glutathione is the most ubiquitous antioxidant in the body. The number one mechanism for removing toxic elements from the body is glutathione. In order for your body to make optimal levels of glutathione, it needs an abundance of the amino acid cysteine. The highest dietary source of cysteine is non-denatured whey protein powder from grass-fed cows. The most non-denatured whey protein powder on the market is one world way one world way is an industry first with its true cool process it retains all the active components of fresh raw whey one world way is rich in immune bodybuilding and detoxification factors that make it a life-giving power food for everyone one world way is sweetened with cold processed stevia and comes in three delicious flavors to hear some impressive testimonies go to oneworldway.com that's one world w-h-e-y.com or call 888-988-3325 are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. You're in the Paracast. You never know what's going to happen next. A special reminder, if you have a comment or question about the Paracast, write us, news at theparacast.com. Once again, that's news at thepowercast.com. We return with Grant Cameron on the Powercast with Gene and Chris, and he's telling us he's had sightings, experiences galore, and you mentioned this one. Now, I know we only have a few moments left and so much ground to cover. Can you maybe highlight a few more of your experiences? Okay, that was the first one. Uh, there's only about four major ones that I remember. I had about 100. The main guy had about 150. In 1976, it was like the CI took the drugs out of the water. It went away, and nobody's had a sighting in that town since. The second night I was out, I told all my friends, I said, this is the most amazing thing you've ever seen. You've got to come see this man. I was just like, it was just crazy. It just like a light went off in my head. And I got all my friends. I dragged them out there, and they sat there, and they're looking, and we're sitting at, out in the middle of nowhere, and there's cars all over the place. Everybody's trying to see this thing from the city, because I live in a major city, and this is about 40 miles out of the city. And uh, we're sitting there, and my friends, I can still remember about an hour later, they said, Ah, Cameron, you know, it's not, you're crazy. We're going back. I said, no, no, hang on. you got to see this most unbelievable. You know? And they said, no, I can still remember. We're hungry. We're going back to Winnipeg for pizza. And they, in, all my buddies got in the car, and off they went. And we sat there about 15 minutes later. This, it was called by some people there the bouncing ping pong ball. It was like this thing jumping around the sky like a flash cube jumping around in the sky. And it, then it came right at us, and it got closer. It was the same object seen the first night. Green glow on the back came right at us and just sort of hesitated. I can remember the car beside us. There was a guy with a camera when motorized first came out. And I can still remember there was a girl who couldn't see it as it was bouncing around the sky. She's crying people swearing, yelling, this guy with his motor drive, click, 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 and he's just unloading the camera as this thing's coming at us. And that was the second night. Then I started to go out, like I just basically, my friends who were with me just went on with their life, like nothing had happened. And with me, it was like a, simply a, an obsession. Somebody's got to know what's going on. I start interviewing the people in the town, trying to find out what's going on. And the, the third biggest one, and it sort of gets into this toxic issue, I was with a friend of mine who is now retired, but was later on became the uh, 
public relations officer or a billion dollar corporation. He was with me. We're seeing these small, the Canadian government guy called, called monitors. We call them ground lights. These things on the ground and we'd go to try to catch up on it. We'd stay a certain distance away from the car and we're in the middle of nowhere. No farms, nothing down these, these roads. Got about eight miles down. There's water all over the fields because it's, it's springtime. It's on this bridge. We go to the bridge, get out of it. We're looking around. The thing is like a ball of light. And go down the other side, look back. The thing's back at the bridge. Go back up. We're trying to look under the bridge, whatever. We go back towards the north again to make the short story short. Things back at the bridge again. I said, come on, Jim. Let's go. Let's walk this time. So we go, and I got a movie camera, 8 millimeter movie, film. Three, uh, I knew it was going to take off. So it took seven steps, three seconds of film. Seven steps, three seconds of film. Seven steps, three seconds of film. Next thing you know, I'm right at the bridge. I'm right there. Can I jump? And I was like, I'm going to touch it. I have to touch this thing. I've got to, I, when I get burned, whatever's going to happen, I've got to touch this thing. So I said to my friend, I said, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to run. I'm going to jump on this thing. And he said, well, hang on. He says, he's got binoculars. I got the movie camera. He says, I think there's one sitting on top of the car. So I look in the binoculars and there's things sitting on top of the car. There's orange smoke hanging down the side of the car. So we took off towards the car. And as soon as I took off, I oh, shoot, turned around. Sure enough, the one at the bridge is gone. I tried to convince him to go back. And he was so scared he didn't want to go back. What years about later, your he, footage here, your film that you took? Footage, I've still got the footage. I was actually, I was just in New Jersey lecturing, and I was talking to Alan, the guy in Washington, and he had agreed to analyze. I've still got the little thing. It's never been, it's been processed, but it's never, never been moved to, um, to film. Still sitting in my desk, the little three, the little three minute things. And uh, I'm sure it's not going to be that great because it was in the middle of the dark and I'm holding an eight, the old 8 millimeter film. It's probably so just, just be a light in the fall. sky, kind of a blurry light. A uh, thing bouncing around. But I was 50 sure. feet away when, when we took the final three seconds of film. Okay. So that, that, was, that was my experience that I was close a number of times. I saw it. I talked to the people, the various experiences. We had the little humanoid case. We had the case of the cattle mutilations and all this kind of stuff, all the, the weird stuff going on. So to me, it was always there. But we can always do down, a show just on your experiences, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then and, and what happened was I, I wrote the manuscript, and I, I put it around to different publishers, and they looked at it, and some of them read it. And then I went to the local publisher, and I'm in a city of 700,000 people. The local publisher, and everybody knew the story. And I remember her coming back with the, the rejection letter and said, Mr. Cameron, you may believe in this kind of stuff. Count me among the unbelievers. And at that point, it was like, never another sighting. I don't care about sightings. This is a total waste of time. You can tell people. They'll be impressed with your little stories. I want to know what's going on. This is a total waste of time. And I've never really dealt with sightings since. All I've been interested in is somebody has to know. If I know what I know with what limited resources I've got, somebody in the government, somebody in the military has to know a heck of a lot more than what I know. And that was the thing that kept me going. And it's like a game. I'm very competitive. And, you know, what else are you going to do? I mean, you, you play the game.